Welcome back. It's an exhilarating time of year. I think every year since I started school in Kensington, California back in uh, 1957, uh, it has been, fall has been exhilarating. Going back to school has been exhilarating. I have to admit that sometimes it only lasted a week or two before the realities of school made it less exciting, but it's all, always still exciting. There's, and I welcome you back to all of that. Um, I, want to, I want to first of all thank all of you for the great work that you do. Uh, I continue to ask students and alumni and parents of students and alumni about their experience at UVU and almost always the answer is still, you know, I love it or I loved it or they loved it. Um, it's a remarkably positive response. And I still ask employers of our students about their experience, and the answers still are always very positive, that they, they really love our graduates, that they just want more of them. So we're really grateful to you for all of that. By the way, one other expression of appreciation, I want to thank Scott Cooksey in the development office for the breakfast this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Don't want to forget that. Thank you. And uh, Cam Martin, and, he, and the Office of Marketing Communication for the cake you will have later, the 75th birthday cake that you'll be able to enjoy. So anyhow, I mean, that is really a remarkable thing. And you see up here, the, my one slide for today is this map. And it's a map of Utah, Wasatch, and Summit counties. And it's on, my, it's on the wall of my office. And I have it there to remind me of our mission that our mission is to address the educational needs of the people within our service area and others who come to UVU. And it's a wonderful mission, and it's an inspiring mission. We have the opportunity, really, to transform lives, to make such a difference. It is, has never been more important that, we, that people have a post-secondary education. You hear me say that all the time, and I will keep saying it all the time because it's something I think about and I think we all need to think about. It's just never been more important. Uh, we, it's very hard for somebody to make a living, to provide for themselves, their family, to contribute to the community if they don't have education beyond high school. And the outcomes that come from that education are, are improve even with additional education. There's extensive research, surveys by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, surveys by the Census Bureau, surveys by the Division of Workforce Services of the state of Utah, research by academics in a variety of different fields, all underscore what a difference it makes. It makes a difference in the quality of their lives and also in their economic outcomes. In economic outcomes alone, they are Incomes go up with the level of education. Unemployment goes down. Incarceration goes down. All kinds of other social problems go down. Commitment to the society goes up. Tolerance, for the most part, goes up. Uh, there, it's you know, really quite remarkable the kind of transformation that occurs from what we're doing. And yet, still too many people within our service area haven't taken advantage of this. And too many who want to have obstacles that are in their way. And there's some things that you are doing as faculty members that are just amazing in helping students to succeed in the way in which they need to do so, and also making an education more available to them. And I can't thank you enough for that. Uh, there are faculty initiatives going on all over campus that are quite remarkable this way. Let me give you just a, a couple of examples. One of them is that the, the faculty in our math department and developmental math and some other faculty members on campus have been working very, very diligently to try to help students not only overcome the obstacle of quantitative literacy to their graduation, which is the biggest single obstacle, curricular obstacle, uh, but also to help students to, to be able to use math in their lives. And we don't have a math requirement, a quantitative literacy requirement, just to have an additional hoop for people to jump. 
Uh, the purpose of it is, is to help them to be able to use those analytical skills and, and capacities in their lives and, of course, to prepare them for additional opportunities. And that's an amazing effort that's going on. And they're making progress in some, in some wonderful ways. We have a group who's also working on the same thing for, for composition, helping students prepare to write. Uh, that there's no more important thing than our ability to write and communicate and have the various literacies that are associated with that. That's a wonderful thing that's going on that can also help students not only complete but succeed after they leave UVU. And I could go on and on. There are faculty members who are helping students do extraordinary things in, so that they're, they compete with the best in the nation in a wide variety of areas, which is really remarkable especially for a regional university. It's remarkable for any university, but especially a regional university. And they're making pretty remarkable successes, um, efforts to be able to help students achieve that success. That's an amazing thing. There are faculty members who are intentionally scheduling themselves at times that are inconvenient for them in order to make it more convenient and even possible for their students to be able to take the courses they need to take to be able to graduate. There are faculty members who are asking that their courses be canceled when they have small enrollments because they realize that the single biggest obstacle to completion is financial and that anything we do to help make our education more affordable helps students in our service area and others who come here to be able to succeed. I want to mention just a few things that, that are within your control to help with student success that we often don't necessarily think about. Obviously, the, the most obvious one is the quality of our teaching and mentoring. We do a great job, but there are, with the development of technologies, with research on pedagogy, there continue to be more and more effective ways of teaching. And as I mentioned yesterday to, to the new faculty, we, most of us want to teach the way we were taught. That's how we're comfortable doing it. That's what we take for granted. And, and I really encourage you to be skeptical about that, as you would with any received knowledge. Um, be skeptical about it. You know, we have, we have a really good office of teaching and learning we've created to help you to think about your teaching, to explore new ways, to use some of the tools. For example, Asynchronous learning pedagogies can be used to make many things we do more effective. You know, that's, that's knowing how to use online asynchronous methods to help students learn. Even in a face-to-face -face class, most of a student's time is spent studying outside of the classroom. We expect two to three hours outside for every hour inside. That's time that can be used more effectively if there are really good asynchronous learning pedagogies that are, that are um, guiding and directing the students during that time. Internships. Normally an internship, one of the weaknesses is the student only gets the experience that that organization has for them that particular semester. It's limited to that. But with good asynchronous learning pedagogies, a faculty member can get a group of students and have them share with each other, comparing and contrasting their experiences and, and referring them back to material they've learned in their, in their coursework and to really enhance and develop that experience so that it's a much richer and more effective one. There are other things that, that you can do to increase the effectiveness of your teaching and help our students succeed. Another one is to really look carefully at the curricula. The more credits a student needs to take, the more expensive it is, and the harder it is to schedule. I often mention that, say, for a bachelor's degree, that's 120 credits, 15 trips to campus per credit, that's 1,800 trips to campus they have to schedule around their lives. They also have to pay for them. Those are things that interfere, because both finance and, and the realities of their lives are things that make it harder for the people in our service area and others who come here to succeed. Let's look really carefully at our curricula. 
what are we requiring? Are we really giving them the most we can to help them succeed for each credit they're paying for and scheduling their lives around? Uh, we've got to be especially careful not to let our own vested interests in our own particular courses and our own particular department interfere with developing the very best curricula for our students. I met with the G GE committee at, uh, this week and I mentioned that to them. It's very important that our general education be the best for them. I am grateful to this day for the general education I received as an undergraduate. It enriches my life all the time. There are many things I do that I wouldn't do, reading, think, all kinds of things that I do I wouldn't do if it hadn't been for that. They get so few credits of that in a bachelor's degree. We need to work together to make sure they're the right ones for them and not for us that they're not scheduled around what we want to teach and when we want to teach, but around them, what they need to learn and when it's convenient for them. That's another thing that will help them with student success. Another thing we can do to help with student success as part of that is to not schedule classes, to schedule classes so that we, we don't have ones that are undersubscribed. We can pace them. I was responsible for a degree program in New York where we looked at every course, we eliminated some, and others we scheduled once every two years, once a year, once a semester, depending upon the rate at which demand existed for those courses. So there was always a good number of students when the course was offered. You can help students through scheduling to be able to afford it and not only make it more convenient for them, but even possible for them to continue their education and complete. So I want to encourage you to think about those things and to do what you can to make an education really excellent, really affordable, and possible for all who are here and coming. We're working on an academic master plan. Uh, it builds on, on our mission. Um, and what we've been given to do. We are a teaching university, and we don't need to be embarrassed about that. I embrace it. I embrace it. It means that we can go after, we can recruit the best teaching faculty members. We can retain them, we can promote them, we can work toward that. We all have that as a shared thing. Our mission statement given to us by the Board of Regents is to be a teaching university with scholarship and service complementing and supporting it. Uh, let's embrace that. That's another thing we can do to help our students to succeed. I value research universities. I studied them as a professor. I, my, I was professor of higher education. I studied universities. I studied research universities. They've done dramatical, dramatic things. They're very important. But teaching universities are also important. Research universities are expensive. Um, they're expensive. Faculty members have, have uh, reduced class loads. By the way, that's another thing you can do is by is not have reduce your teaching load any more than you absolutely have to because that takes you out of the classroom. You have less influence with the students and it raises the expense for them. But we have a different mission. Our mission is teaching. Our mission is making education available to these people and others who come. Our mission is to transform lives in a dramatic way. And so as we begin a new academic year, again, I thank you so much for all that you're doing and encourage you to think about these things that we can do to enable our students to succeed even more than they do now and enable more of them to come and to finish and to go on and have rich and meaningful lives. And I, I express my appreciation. Thank you all and welcome to a new year. So I was told that we need to, you know, I have 10 minutes, and now that we're two minutes into that 10 minutes, I've been crossing off paragraphs. I've learned how to do that uh, in the past, but welcome to UVU. And uh, I hope you had a great summer, but I hope you are excited, anxious, and ready, and think about it, for the 32 plus thousand students who are gonna walk through the doors on Monday morning. 
And uh, so now, uh, Vice President Olson has talked about student success, and I want to kind of focus on just a few things here uh, as far as the as defining student success. So I crossed off a few paragraphs, but one thing that all of us have heard, and that is we now have a new political environment that imposes uh, performance-based funding to Utah's system of higher education. So there's a lot of concern and effort being focused on student success here at UVU, as well as our sister institutions across the state. So Joe uh, Cusio from Marymount College states that defining student success is the critical step toward promoting it. Now, we, I could, and I'm sure we will continue that philosophical discussion throughout this semester, but that's not what I want to do this morning. What I'd like to do is focus on some of the things that you have already done. And so to do that, student success, let's take a look at some of the students who've been in your classroom, just a couple of them. And one of them, uh, this is Ryan Card. He's a very typical example of students who matriculate with UVU. He's a first generation uh, student. None of his family on either side has ever gone beyond high school graduation. He was a formidable wrestling contender and at South Summit High School in Camas, and he graduated uh, from high school in 2009, and then he married his high school sweetheart a month and a half later. So now we have a very young man who's a very young husband thinking, okay, now how do I take care of my wife and the family that we hope to have someday. So he and his wife made a different decision. They decided to go to college. But the only one that made sense to him because of his lack of focus in high school was one that had open enrollment. So he came to UVU. He came to you. Now, when he came, being a good athlete, he decided exercise physiology would be what he uh, wanted to, uh, to, to major in. And so as he got there, and as he got, uh, arrived in some of your classes, he was mentored by a few faculty and one uh, academic advisor. And so I asked him just last week, so who is the most influential at UVU in your life? And he thought about it just for a couple of sec seconds, and he said, Dr. Brent, Brett Boyer and Kristen Anderson. Dr. Boyer truly cares for his students and makes a conscious effort to reach out to each one of his students. Kristen Anderson, and I hope she's here this morning, never let me say never. She kept encouraging me and reassuring me to the point that the only idea that was left in my head was success. Those two had him raise his sights to something he never considered. He graduated from UVU in December and was accepted to Campbell University School of Osteopathic Medicine in North Carolina in December. So now he has a different thing to deal with. How do I pay for medical school? So he went to the U.S. Air Force, the Armed Services, graduated uh, from officer training school in April 21st, and that's why he missed his graduation here. And then he uh, has now begun classes in North Carolina in his medical school on August 1st. So I, I asked him, because in medical school, if you know, uh, they have an intense week of coursework and then they have a brutal exam every Monday morning, and that's pretty standard. So I asked him, Ryan, how did you do in your tests? And he laughed. He said, Dr. Bracken, I got 100% on my first exam in medical school. And he says, I was stoked. He says, I know I can do this. So thank you. Thank you to Brett Boyer, Dr. Brett Boyer, and Kristen Anderson 
for making a changing the destiny of this little family for generations to come. Now, one other one, and he didn't send very many pictures, and, and you'll, you'll see why. This is his graduation from New York University School of Medicine. This is uh, Fabio Sageman, if, it very, if any of you uh, may have known him. He, and I'm going to quote him, because this is, again, a very typical student coming to UVU. My story begins with graduating from high school with an embarrassing 2.6 GPA with no intent of attending college. My father ran a successful construction business and my plan was to follow in his footsteps. While serving as a missionary in New York City, I was mentored by a mission president who convinced me of the importance of higher education. Not having taken any of the appropriate entrance exams, I needed an open enrollment opportunity upon returning home, and UVU was a no-brainer. So, he says, while there, there was a mistake made in my course schedule. I was accidentally enrolled in Biology 1610 for majors, rather than Biology 1010 for non-majors. It was a tough course, and I met talented students with pre-health care ambitions. I worked hard and earned an A for the first time. And then I considered the opportunity of medicine since there's no physicians in my extended family. I graduated from UVU this summer of 2009, majoring in biology and minor in chemistry. The, the faculty who influenced me the most was Dr. Wayne Whaley, Dr. Gomini, and then, quote, I have no idea how to pronounce his last name, so I won't try, uh, Dr. Craig Tulin, and Dr. Catherine, uh, Catherine Stevens. Fabio is one of the three applicants to gain early acceptance to the University of Utah's School of Medicine, but due to a, uh, a life event that occurred in his life and his, and his new wife, he just, they decided to look elsewhere. So they, he had been accepted at multiple schools, so he decided to go to New York University School of Medicine. There he published 10 manuscripts uh, and also had the first child, Asher. Now, at the end of medical school, he decided he wanted to be a, a, a cardiothoracic surgeon. Now, you have to understand what that takes. That's five years residency for general surgery, two years of research, and then you can apply for a three-year fellowship to learn how to do uh, cardiothoracic surgery. Some of the leaders in the, in the medical field decided that was too much and they were not getting as many applicants as they needed. So they did, they reduced that where you could go into a six-year residency directly into cardiothoracic surgery. Fabio Sageman was one of the first accepted into that program at uh, Rochester, New York. And so here you see him, and I like his little statement at the bottom. I'm the one on the right that's, that's doing uh, open or doing uh, bypass surgery on this patient with his mentor. So coming back to his statement here. So Dr. Wayne Whaley, Dr. Gomini, and that's all I can pronounce, uh, Dr. Uh, Craig Tulin, Dr. Bruce Wilson, uh, especially had an impact in his life to change from what he wanted. Thank goodness there was a mistake in his uh, enrollment at the very beginning. But to these professors, thank you. You have made a permanent change in the destiny of this family for generations to come. So next Monday morning, when the students walk through the doors and into your classrooms, it takes it just small things make huge differences in the lives of your students. Listen to them, encourage them, and make them, help them to believe in themselves. Once that happens, they will do the rest. And thank you for your time. And also I've been asked, 
don't clap because the next speaker is a lot better. Okay. It's my privilege to introduce Courtney Davis. Uh, she, she has taught at UVU since 2007, both as a lecturer and assistant professor in the Department of Arts and Design. She teaches a range of history courses focusing on American and European art from the 19th and the 20th centuries. She's also a licensed attorney. Courtney is passionate about topics related to arts management, freedom of expression, and copyright law. And I have to tell you, as a faculty senate president, she also serves diligently on the faculty senate, and I cannot tell you how much we rely on her and her opinions and her uh, consulting with us in the decisions that we make. So Courtney Davis. Thank you so much for that introduction. It is my honor and privilege to be invited to speak today. And let me echo my, my thanks also to Academic Affairs and the Convocation Committee for organizing this event. From banners and pins to websites, books, artworks, exhibitions, and the general feeling of pride and UV euphoria, 2016 is our year. From a fledgling vocational trade school to a regional institution of higher learning, UVU inspires us with its history, one built upon dreams, tireless dedication, and an unwavering commitment to progress. Our institutional history is a part of all of us. With so much transformation and evolution, we are deeply aware of the roles we play, our position within UVU genealogy. As faculty, we can count the branches of our institutional family tree in the form of courses developed, degrees created, and programs added. But always, our mission stays the same. As a teaching institution, to provide opportunity to promote student success and to meet our regional educational needs. For me, our institutional history is literally part of my own family history, and my family's history is part of the community mission of our institution. After World War II, my great uncle attended the Central Utah Vocational School, the very first incarnation of UVU. In the early 1960s, my father earned a certificate in electrical technology from the vocational school just before it became the Utah Trade Technical Institute. And I don't really know who these people are, but I may or may not be related to them, and they look like they're having a great time, so I had to include them. In the 1980s, my mother took classes at Utah Valley Community College to be followed by my brother, who attended Utah Valley State College in the 1990s. UVU, through all of its incarnations, provided an opportunity for my family they would not otherwise have had, and in effect, inspired my own passion for education. Both of my parents were technically first generation, at least in their lines. In fact, as a child, I had the opportunity of being part of my mother's experience at UVCC as a non-traditional student, juggling family commitments and a love of learning. Through her journey, I learned about the process of higher education and also about the first generation experience, which for many is one of uncertainty, of trial and error, and of climbing fences. To illustrate this point, one vivid memory springs to mind when my mother returned home rather late from her evening space planning class. She had taken a wrong turn from the Sparks Automotive Building, which incidentally is very close to where my office is in the GT, and she found herself, found herself in a fenced-in playground, the ancestor to the We Care Center. Unfortunately, the door locked behind her, trapping her inside the eight-foot-tall enclosure. It was winter, naturally, and in the archaic pre-cell phone age. With the night dragging on, she did the only thing she could think of. She climbed that eight-foot-tall chain-link fence with her size five violet spike-killed pumps and fuchsia 1980s sweater dress. In my mind, this is the perfect metaphor, not just for the college experience, but for the first generation experience. Sitting here today, we all know that the path through higher education is far from idyllic, and we would probably all agree that isn't necessarily a bad thing. I often tell my students half of what I learned about in school wasn't the content material, but everything else. The classes are dropped for non-payment, as many students learned just last week. 
that taking 20 credits might seem like a really good idea in August, but not in November. The printers will invariably jam 15 minutes before a paper is due, it happened to me every time, and that some doors will lock behind you, and you will need to do some creative, on-the-spot problem solving. It's why professors enforce deadlines, eschew volumes of extra credit, and still at times embrace the Socratic method. But for the first-gen student, especially those coming directly from high school, this new foreign system can be not only anxiety-inducing, but seemingly unnavigable. They might not see fences to climb, but barricades, insurmountable obstacles, proof they are on the wrong path. Gaps in knowledge can intensify the challenges faced by first-gen students. They simply might not have previous experience with specific disciplines or subjects. Although this can occur in any field, it is of particular relevance to the arts. Indeed, the benefit of a liberal or fine arts education is sometimes overlooked in the first generation context. Indeed, studies indicate that educational attainment and childhood exposure are typically the most important demographic factors in predicting arts attendance. But unfortunately, many first gen students lack a meaningful experience with the arts. Despite the pivotal role the arts play in fostering visual literacy and engendering strong, creative, and critical thinking skills, most of us would agree that the arts suffer on a K through 12 level, even being labeled as a reward or recess activity. In the secondary education context and beyond, the arts are sometimes regarded simply as a means of personal expression or an extracurricular hobby. Like many within the arts, I have encountered this pedagogical fence to climb in my GE art history courses, the I'm only here because I have to be attitude. It doesn't help that President Obama himself made an offhand and now infamous comment in 2014 about the earning potential of a degree in art history. So sad. However, in response to an email written by Ann Johns, senior lecturer in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Texas at Austin, the White House delivered a handwritten apology letter from the president. And quoting from a section, let me apologize for my off-the-cuff remarks. I was making a point about the jobs market, not the value of art history. As it so happens, art history was one of my favorite subjects in high school, and it has helped me to take a great deal of joy in my life that I might otherwise have missed." End quote. In addition to being a marvelous story whisper around, whispered around art department water coolers for the past two years, I reference this letter because of the president's statement, it has helped me take a great deal of joy in my life that I might otherwise have missed. This is true of many of us regarding the arts. But in addition to contributing to aesthetic enjoyment, the arts are also a form of visual communication. I think President Obama would agree that one of the most iconic images in modern presidential campaign history is Shepard Fairey's Hope Poster of 2008, a representation that some feel helped sway the election and which sparked countless appropriations, parodies, and at least one notable copyright lawsuit involving the artist. The arts function as a gateway. They speak to us not only on the levels of taste, personal preference, and emotional response, they provide access to deeper, more profound planes of historical and cultural significance. Like the Dutch Baroque master Johannes Vermeer, French Romanticist Théodore Géricault, and lively Impressionists Edgar Degas and Mary Cassatt. But gaining access to advanced levels of meaning and value often requires a guide, without which we would remain on the other side of the fence, so to speak. A perfect example is the sometimes esoteric world of contemporary art. I suspect that some of us, in fact, many of us, might have found ourselves in a museum of some kind, perhaps to be confronted with something like this. The following inner dialogue might ensue. What is that? Really, how is that art? It's a pile of candy. Wait, wait, what, what does the text panel say? I can take a piece? Now this is ridiculous, what's next? Toilets as art? Rotten food? Vacuum cleaners? By the way, as an art historian, I can resolutely say the answer is yes. 
Yes. Sorry about that one. And yes. If the inner dialogue stopped there, we would not only miss the point, we might walk away with a newfound contempt for contemporary art. But the dialogue shouldn't end there. Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA is a work by the late artist Felix Gonzalez Torres, and the ever shrinking and ever replenishing pile of wrapped candies is an allegorical portrait of the artist's partner, Ross Laycock, who succumbed to AIDS related complications in 1991. The glossy, wrapped, sugary morsels represent the ephemeral nature of human life, the sweetness of love and loss and the subtle texture of memory. The installation began at, and is periodically refilled to, 175 pounds, the healthy, ideal weight of Ross Laycock. As each viewer takes a piece, the candy spill recedes, day by day, piece by piece, fading away, but at the same time, gaining new life in the minds hearts and bodies of viewers whose single piece of candy functions as a microcosm of memory, a symbol of the ephemerality of life, a perfect memento mori. Moving even beyond the aesthetic sensory experience, the work of Gonzalez Torres links into a rich heritage of modern and contemporary art history. To understand Untitled fully as an artistic work, one must also have a familiarity with ready-made sculpture, first introduced by the now infamous Marcel Duchamp, an artist on the forefront of Dada, a style that emerged in the 19-teens in a response to the brutalities and the madness of the First World War. After Dada, artists experimented heavily with conceptualism, art about the idea rather than the final product, a trend that dominated the 20th century vanguard, even with such styles as pop art, the direct ancestor to the style of Gonzalez Torres. What I've just described to you illustrates what many art theorists label as the cultural code, the background information needed to unlock the layered meaning of artworks, far beyond the knee-jerk, yes, I like it, or no, I don't, responses so prevalent in our social media age. Without the cultural code, Portrait of Ross in LA remains a pile of candy on the museum floor. Yinka Shonabari's post-colonial inspired installations look like clothing props. And Yasumasa Morimura's work seems, well, rather bizarre to say the least. Not understanding the cultural code locks viewers from meaning. It acts as a deterrent. This is the case not only with cryptic contemporary works, but even with historical masterpieces that might be seen as out of touch, out of date, or too difficult to understand. This is not an experience relegated to first-generation students, but the first-gen context can present a specific set of circumstances that make studying and appreciating the arts much more challenging. Not only are the arts popularly perceived as a sector with limited job opportunities, even within pro uh, professional and academic circles, the arts are often tinged with the stigma of elitism, Certain people go to museums, or the opera, or the theater. A stereotype as common as the perception of the bohemian artist or the free-spirited dancer. Because of these cultural perceptions, first-generation students can experience emotional or psychological barriers that prevent them from accessing the arts. When I teach GE classes and require students to visit our own Woodbury Art Museum, and I have to say, that's after convincing them a museum does, in fact, exist at University Mall. I'll just throw that in there. University Place now. At least one student invariably reveals this was his or her very first experience in an art museum. Those less familiar with the art sometimes feel out of place at museums, galleries, performance halls, and the like, and thus seek to avoid them. Arts organizations are well aware of these barriers with respect to audience development and the encouragement of first-time participation. As we learned with contemporary art, similar cultural codes exist throughout the arts. Serge Dorney, director general of the Lyon National Opera has noted, quote, for the first time concert goer, the unwritten codes of music appreciation can seem as demanding as Tamino's initiation rituals in Mozart's The Magic Flute. Get to your seat before the music starts. Sit still. 
Listen in silence without wrestling the program or tapping your feet. And don't, on any account, applaud between movements. If you have a music degree, you're off to a good start. If you haven't, and your motivation is pure pleasure, then you may feel you were in the right place at the wrong time." End quote. As educators, we counter the centuries-old belief that the arts are reserved for only a certain type or group of people, an idea inherited from days of royal co courts and aristocratic patronage. But expanding the inclusion of artistic appreciation not only entails the creation of new opportunities for experience, it can also require a shift in personal understanding and even identity. This can be problematic in the first generation context where shifting or evolving tastes might not be viewed completely positively. Some students experience a level of anxiety when confronted with new ideas that might seem to run counter to their personal traditions. Indeed, writing for the Washington Post in 2015, Linda Banks Santilli, associate professor of education at Willock College, theorizes that, quote, guilt is one of the biggest struggles first generation college students face. Reacting to their disruption of intergenerational continuity, many first generation students may come to develop two different identities, one for home and another for college, end of quote. Those of us in the arts are aware of or familiar with the what do I tell my parents conversation. <laughs> parents who don't understand why their child would possibly want to major in the arts. What do I tell them? Students ask like a whispered confession. It's what I love, but everyone tells me I'll never get a job. Sensitive to the job market, first-gen students are usually highly attuned to the cost-benefit analysis of higher education. They see college as a gateway to a better job and a better future. And so it should be. Although as faculty, we have the opportunity of guiding students to understand that a better job and a better future may require, or at least be enhanced by, skills developed through experience with the arts, such as visual literacy, creative and critical thinking, conceptualization, and theory development. These abilities are so highly prized that even the Yale University School of Medicine requires first-year medical students to take an art history course in order to improve observation skills and consequently improve patient diagnosis. Similarly, Anne Levine, a noted law school admissions expert, named art history as her pick for one of the best majors for law school prep. Why? Because in her words, it teaches you to look at something you've never seen before and apply the facts you've learned to determine just what you're looking at. The immense value of these interpretive, conceptual, and theory-based skills is sometimes less recognized by first-gen students. They can also be overlooked by another related segment of our population, the first-generation student in America. For many of our international students, learning to navigate the American system presents similar challenges to the broader first-gen population, particularly in relationship to identity, cultural experience, and personal or familial expectations. With these two student populations, much focus is often placed on pedagogy, retention, and employability. But yet, we as faculty should not lose sight of those intangible opportunities that don't show up in data sets or statistical calculations. Opportunities not just for students, but for institutions to grow. This year, as we reflect upon our past, present, and future, we should consider what these students, with all of their voices, their experiences, their backgrounds, hopes, and dreams, bring to our university. I'd like to conclude with an example of work created by one of our own students. This past spring, Ukrainian-born student Sergei Khrushchev created an artwork called Cocoon. Part sculpture, part performance, Cocoon was created in the Science Building Atrium during Engaged Learning Week as part of a project for my contemporary art history class. The artwork represented six years of the artist's life, six years in America, six years of memory, experience, and transformation. The performance lasted two hours, the time needed for Khrushchev and his assistants to mold and shape more than one half ton of clay into a rounded structure large enough to fit the artist's body. The objective was simple, to create a clay cocoon from which to emerge triumphantly. In the artist's words, quote, 
Cocoon is just a shell. The last stage of Cocoon is breaking out to freedom, so I am breaking all the walls of oppression, anxiety, discrimination to come out anew. Khrushchev will graduate this spring with a Bachelor's of Fine Art and Sculpture and intends to pursue further graduate studies. His education, skills, and vision shaped by outstanding faculty mentors like ceramics professors Mark Talbert and Brian Jensen. Indeed, Sarah Gay's work, which was featured in the UVU Review in April, embodies the transformation of identity, not dissimilar to the metamorphosis from the nervous, uncertain freshman who sits in our classroom on the very first day to the confident, triumphant graduate taking the next step in life, if we can just keep them on their path. For some, the path requires the occasional climbing of fences. For others, it is breaking through walls to begin life anew. That is the mission of our university, providing opportunity, promoting student success, and meeting educational needs. And we are not alone. Our history, our 75 years, as lengthy as it seems to us, is but a mere slice in the broader historical tradition which links us between past, present, and future. Thank you. Thank you so much, that was lovely. Um, it's now my pleasure to be able to introduce to you today our featured keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Emden. Uh, you can see Dr. Emden's bio in the program and I will read it to you. Dr. Emden is a social critic, public intellectual and science advocate whose commentary on issues of race, culture, inequality and education have appeared in dozens of influential periodicals, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Forbes, and Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics, Science, and Technology at Teachers College, Columbia University, where he also serves as a director, or the director, of secondary school initiatives at the Urban Science Education Center. Dr. Emden is an expert on improving urban education, the intersection of hip hop and education, STEM, education, excuse me, politics, race, class, diversity, and youth empowerment. He is an advisor to numerous international organizations, school districts, and schools where he delivers speeches and holds workshops and professional development sessions for students, teachers, policymakers, and other education stakeholders within the public and private sector. Dr. Emden writes the provocative Emden Five series on a number of contemporary social issues for the Huffington Post and draws on his extensive experience as a former physics and chemistry teacher, school administrator, and urban education researcher to write about topics that range from school bullying and student protests to parental involvement and the political landscape of urban America. He is the author of the recently award-winning book, recently released award-winning book, Urban Science Education for the Hip-Hop Culture. Christopher Emden holds a PhD in urban education with a concentration in mathematics, science, and technology, master's degrees in both natural sciences and education administration, and bachelor's degrees in physical anthropology, biology, and chemistry. It's outstandingly amazing. Um, just to let you know, you can buy Christopher Emden's book for white folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too, Reality Pedagogy and Urban Education. You can actually buy that uh, outside today. I've got our post-it for $20. I'm gonna buy my own copy. Let us please welcome Dr. Christopher Emden. That's a great introduction, thank you. So I, had, I hadn't seen that um, bio in, in quite a while. So I'm, I'm really curious as to where that one came from. Um, so a lot of it is definitely very accurate, but I, I've, um, I've since done some other pretty cool stuff. So um, like I'm now associate professor. I'm really excited about that. But anyway, um, but, but that's not the point of the conversation. I have one hour. Um, and in that hour, I have so much I want to share with you. So I'm going to give a couple of disclaimers and I'm going to get right into the talk, okay? Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that because I have a lot that I want to pack into this hour, I'm going to speak relatively quickly. 
Um, and so if my pace of speaking is just too fast for you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I will take that for a cue, and I'll slow down just a little bit. I would probably kick back up again, and so just raise your hand once more, and, and so we'll, we'll figure it out together. Is that fair? So, can we fulfill that under bargain? That's cool. Um, and the second disclaimer uh, before I speak is that I'm sure that over the course of my talk, I will probably say one thing, maybe two, that will offend someone. And so if you're terribly offended, just like get up, you know, go for a quick walk, you know, get it off your chest, and then come back, because I may say something afterwards that you may totally love. Um, and, and the reason why I give that second disclaimer is probably the most important disclaimer, is that um, I feel as though my responsibility whenever I come to a space to share some thoughts and words and ideas about teaching and the craft and the art of teaching, it actually requires us really pushing the boundaries of, of what we know and what we think is right to do. And I would be remiss if I came all the way to Utah and I just made you feel good and then went back home. So, so my intent is to, you know, make you feel good, but also challenge a little bit if that's okay. Um, and so now let's get into the talk, right? So one of the things that, that, that made me want to come to give this talk in particular, um, because, you know, and I'm also gonna give a third disclaimer. Um, third disclaimer is that my wife loves me very much. And she says, Chris, what I love the most about you is that you're probably the most brutally honest human being I've ever met. And, and in the same breath, she says, Chris, the thing that I despise the most about you is that you're probably the most brutally honest human being I've ever met. Um, and, and so I'll say that and then say this. So part of the reasons why I wanted to come here and give this particular talk today, um, despite the fact that I actually had like two other talks I was supposed to give, um, was that I wanted to come to UVU. And so the question is like, why did he want to come to UVU in particular, right? Like you're in, you live in New York, you know, it's Utah, like, hello, you know, last time I checked, you were black, not many black folks hanging out here. Like, so why would you want to come, right? And, and the reason why I wanted to come was because I delved deeply into the history and the mission of the institution. And there is something about being in a place and space where everyone from an administra administration down and also historically has focused on this idea of being predicated on and having their strengths be the fact that they are a teaching institution, right? Like it's a badge that you hold proudly. It is the anchor of where you are. It is riddled through the mission. It's come down through even state government. Like we want you to guys to be the teaching institution. And we live in a current climate across higher education where there has not been a privileging of folks who focus on the art and craft of teaching as the anchor of their institution. And because of that, it is important for you to know that I find you and your work and your craft and your mission so special that you champion that piece in the midst of the larger climate. And because you champion this notion of teaching as the anchor of your instruction, it's gonna require an extra responsibility to ensure that the quality of your teaching, the nature of your teaching, the ins and outs and details and nuances and crannies of the teaching takes on a space where it's transformative. You cannot profess to be a teaching institution that prides itself on the art and craft of teaching and approach the nature of teaching from a passe, um, archaic idea of teaching. Because in that instance, you may as well not be a teaching institution and do things the exact same way that everybody else has. Why is that important? It's important because we are dealing with a higher education climate that is grappling with that tension right now. And the tension is not one between teaching and non-teaching per se. It's between expectations of what we're supposed to profess as institutions and what we know is right to do. It's about these sort of institutional memories that people can intellectually want to sort of depart from but in practice can't do anything about moving beyond. It's embodied in a talk I gave four years ago at Stanford um, when a project that I was working on received this, this, this great national attention. I was so excited about it that, that it got this attention, but I didn't expect it at all. And the project essentially involved me as a science geek and dweeb working with young people across urban spaces to learn science more effectively. And part of the project for me was how do I get them to be more sort of attuned to and connected to science when every time I walk into science classrooms, they are absolutely bored to death, right? Like I, I would literally walk into a classroom and kids are like propping up their heads with their hands. 
like to keep from falling asleep, like going through literal physical changes to ensure that he can stay up in these classes. And, and so I, I was watching these young folks and they, they were high school students and, and community college students sort of bored to death. And then I would go into the community and just follow them around. And, 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 and not in like a creepy, like, why is this bald dude following us around kind of way, right? But, but like, like a researchy, let's study these cats, right? So, so, I, so I go in and, and I, I start following these students who are completely disengaged in the classroom around. And I start finding out things about their life worlds that the schools at all did not consider in their teaching. So the first thing I would notice was like, they're from like these really tough communities, right? And that didn't at all happen to be reflected in the instruction. And many of them were immigrant families. I'm like, none of the instruction reflected the fact that we're talking about immigrant students. And most importantly, that these students were doing these things is called like um, hip hop battles and they'd be in these hip hop ciphers on their street corners and their really broken neighborhoods and communities and, and, and they would be excited. They would have like this immense joy. They would be rapping to each other and finishing each other's sentences and, and literally like holding hands and, and, and like putting their arms around each other and it was this sort of celebratory experience around this thing that seemingly had nothing at all to do with academics. And what struck me was, man, they are so excited despite the hor horrific conditions of their everyday experiences. They have all this immense joy. And then we bring them into the school and the schools are great schools. They're well-funded, they look pretty, they're super nice, but they're bored to death. So how is it that a pretty school, you guys follow me? A pretty school bores folks to death and a, a seemingly like tough backdrop excites them. And so I said, well, what I want is I want the same kind of experiences they have in their neighborhoods when they were doing this rap stuff to happen in the science classroom. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I need that type of excitement to happen. And so eventually, after trying a bunch of other things that I didn't want to try, I, you know, I was like, oh, well, maybe, if I, uh, maybe if I had them all stand up, because you know, when they were rapping, they were standing up. So we went to the school. Hey, guys, why don't you stand up and learn science? And so they would just like stand up and fall asleep. You know, so I was, I was like, so that won't work. And, and you know, maybe if I had you guys, um, and I, I was just, maybe if I had you guys all sort of gathered together in circles, and they would, they would, they would gather in circles, it'd work a little bit, but then they'd fall back asleep. So it wasn't the fall, it wasn't the standing up. And, it, and, and do you know what kind of pains I went through to try to identify what would work when what could work was standing in my face all along? Like, like literally, what I needed to do was have them rap. Now, I'm not asking you guys to have your students rap. I, I want you to just follow this story. The idea was I could see the thing in my face that could make them be engaged, but my notion of respectability, of what a college classroom should look like, what a high school classroom could look like, helped me to justify the avoidance of the thing that was glaring in my face about what needed to work for my students. And the minute I had them do some raps around science content, we had them literally learning so much content that it was mind boggling. Right? They, they, would, they would cram in a semester-long physics class into a three-minute rap song. And, and, and it, it boggled the minds of everyone around us, like, how is this happening? And the answer was, I had to focus on what was innately who they were first. Despite the fact that it pushed back against all the things that I thought was right to do. And once I made that connection, I transformed their lives forever. Now, you may not be dealing with urban students per se, or you may, but you're dealing with a population with these first generation students who have very, very different realities than what the institution is preparing them for. They have very different norms and everyday practices than what we've been prepared for as educators. Listen, all of you who are sitting in this room right now are the exception to the rule when it comes to the general populace and being educated. Did you realize that? Do you realize that there are people who are come from places where you're from, where like you're the special smart one who was smart enough to be able to go and get a master's degree or a PhD degree and then be able to sit in an institution and be a university professor. The reality is that the majority of the population do not have the kind of educational accolades that you have. We must begin with the point of confronting the fact that we come with some privilege. Now, once we recognize that, we have to understand that by virtue of our privilege, that a majority of the population don't have what we have. But our job as educators is to do what? Get those hundreds and thousands of people who don't have what we have to be able to get what we have. Are you following me? And if that's the case, we have to understand that what worked for us is actually not what's gonna work for them. We as a minority in this sort of, thank you, 
we as a minority in this place, as far as the ones who can achieve, we got to understand something. You know, we are either one or two. We're either resilient enough to overcome the challenges and trauma of contemporary education, meaning like you just know how, to, look, I'm bored to death, but I know that I have to study harder, so I will. And you didn't like the experience when you were in school yourself, but you knew you had to be resilient enough to do it. Dig deep, it's there. Or, or you're the other type, which is like, I'm just good at school. Like, I'm super smart. My mom told me I'm super smart. My dad told me I'm super smart. So I'll continue to be super smart. I'll go get these higher degrees because I am super smart. But the super smart folks and the resilient folks actually reflect not much of everyone else. And what happens when we come to institutions like these is we are teaching these, 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 these students who are these first gen students as though they were many versions of us that even in a teaching institution, we are teaching as though who we are teaching reflects a minority of the larger populace. So you're teaching them like, hey, you guys are either here as super smart or super resilient because that's how everybody else who's sitting around here in this room right now is. Are you following me? But the reality is that, guys, we are the very ones who are boring folks to death. We are the very ones who are engaging in practices that are disconnected from people. And when I say that, I don't say you are. I also want you guys to understand that this work for me is a we are. Listen, I was raised in the, in the Bronx, New York. Came up of age in the 80s when it was a very sort of challenging time, right? The neighborhoods were riddled with challenges. And I was able to go through that process and, and have some success in schools. I was actually not a good student in high school, but when I got to undergrad, like the world opened up. And the world opened up to me because I went in for the first semester and I hated all my classes and then I went into a biology class and I had this one professor. And she wasn't like the best professor per se, but, and that's exactly what you were saying in your, in your talk, like that one professor that has an impact, right? She wasn't the best professor per se, but this is what happened to me. She, she, she needed, students to come into her research lab. And no one would volunteer after like three weeks of school. And so she looked around and says, you know, hey, you, come to my lab. And I'm like, for what? And she's like, well, you'll get extra credit. And I was like, well, well I, I probably need the extra credit even before my first exam. Let me tell you why that's important. The notion of I will need extra credit before my first exam is actually the mindset that your students are walking into when they come into your classroom. They already walk into that place feeling some deficiency, feeling some, how am I going to work through this? So I, I took that leap based on the fact that I thought little of myself. And when I got there, I started realizing the biology was not what I thought it was. I thought it was memorize a bunch of information and pass a test. And then I, she started showing me, well, you know, biology is actually doing some stuff. And, and it was hands on. It was interactive. And, and after I realized that, I fell so in love with biology because she introduced me to the fun and the life of biology. Now, what I love the most about the lab, y'all follow me? Let me take my sweat, like, I'm take my jacket off, I'm getting warm. Look, the, the one thing that I love the most about the lab, guys, do you know that it wasn't the research per se? It was the fact that when I walked into the biology lab, there was music playing in the back. And I was like, what, they let music in school? Like, is that okay? And she said, well, we're in the lab, and so what we do is we have all the researchers pick whatever they want to listen to because we could play music in the backdrop as we do the research, and it blew my mind. And then she said, do you, you know, I was like, well, you know, what do I need to wear in here? She was like, well, you need to wear a lab coat. And I was like, well, do I need to wear a suit and tie and, and, and wear dress shoes? And she was like, well, you could wear whatever you want under your lab coat as long as you don't show up naked. And I said, well, that's great. You know, so, so, I, so, so let's follow along now. So now I could, and, and some may have, oh, but we don't know because they had lab coats on. But the point was, I had music playing in the backdrop, which made me feel like, oh my gosh, I could play my own music. So I was introducing my music to my fellow peers. I could wear whatever I wanted. I could use whatever slang I wanted to use in my conversations, as long as the biology research I was doing on the etiology of schizophrenia could, com could, con could can add to the, ex the, 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 um, the experience of learning more content. Y'all follow me? Like, that it wasn't about the content that she was teaching me per se. It was by, by my understanding that I could be a biologist by being myself. Are we creating classroom context that allows the first generation students that walk into our classrooms to feel that by virtue of being first generation students alone makes them equipped to be academically successful? 
you know, are we showing them that the fact that you're the first one to make it to this place actually means that you have an inbuilt resilience already, and I'm going to value that in my class. In fact, I'm going to praise you for that publicly in my class so that you can have a self-confidence about who you are that allows you to be able to be academically successful. Like, like I want us to understand that the, the, the success of our students is not predicated on the, on, the, on the quality of the content we're delivering, but rather on the context that we create in the classroom to allow them to feel like they're comfortable on their own terms from the second they walk in. And if we could create those contexts in our classroom, we can transform lives. We can fully embody the notion of being a teaching institution because we understand the complexity and the nuances of what it means to actually teach. To teach is not to deliver information. To teach is not to get somebody to understand your content better. To teach is to light a fire and passion in that person and make them believe that by virtue of who they are, they can be successful. So, so let's move, I didn't even get into my talk yet. So, so let's move on. Look, so now as we move on, I want us to understand that we are not just moving on and talking about teaching, but we're changing the narrative of what teaching and learning looks like. Are you following me on this journey? Do you want to be with me on this journey? All right? So when I, when I went to that talk at Stanford, I remember, I remember that story, I'm going to weave that story back. Uh, um, they, they invited me there because of the stuff that happened with my kids who were rapping and, and because of like m my mentor. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and my other mentor, Jizza from Wu-Tang Clan. Yes, different mentors. We're going to talk about why that's important. And, and, and so they said, come give this talk. And so I was excited. I'm going to Stanford to give this talk. So I go and give this talk. And after the talk, they said, great, great job. Thanks for talking about your research. And then a the guy came to me and said, you know, your talk was cool. But what I like the most about it is that you brought the techies and the fuzzies together. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I'm like, the techies and the fuzzies, like, like, what are you talking about? And he goes, listen, no one says this on this campus. And I, and I know that our, our, our second in charge guy here is a Stanford guy, so he knows this all too well, right? He says, no one says this on this campus, but um, you know, we, we've divided the campus between the techies and the fuzzies. And I said, what does that mean? And he goes, well, all the folks who do real science, like the hard sciences, they're the techies. The STEM folks, the engineering folks, the nanotechnology folks, the other techies. And then all the other folks, you know, our history, which I'm thinking of her, right? Like the art history folks, the social, like those are the fuzzies. And usually on this campus, the techies and the fuzzies don't talk. It's like an invisible line between the campus, between the techies and the fuzzies. And he's like, this is the first time that I've seen only all the techies and the fuzzies together having a conversation because the music and art and hip hop stuff brought the fuzzies in and then the science stuff brought the techies in. Now, why is that interesting? When you deconstruct the statistics related to who's the techies and the fuzzies, something fascinating happens. Well, those who are the techies, who are the supposed to be smart science-minded folks, you interrogate them and say, well, what made you think that you were a scientist? And they go, well, I I've just always been naturally good at it. Um, who told you that? My, well, my parents told me that. My teachers told me that. I've always felt that way. And then you ask more probing questions and you say, well, you know, like what, what, what was like the motivating factor to make you decide that you wanted to be um, a, a, a techie? And, and they go, well, like I was just naturally good at it. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Well, well thanks for, for sharing that. And then you go to the fuzzies and you say the same thing. Well, wh why? Well, I did this naturally, I'm just really good at it. And then most importantly, then you start asking the real questions. The real question is, well, you find that most of the fuzzies had parents who were fuzzies. Y'all following me? It's like, well, what do your parents, well, my parents made me, made the, you know, they went to college and they, they, they just loved art history, you know? Right? And then you ask the techies, and they're like, well, you know, you start interrogating them. Well, you know, my grandfather was a scientist, and my, my mother was, a, was an anthrobiochemist as well. And so why that's fascinating for me is that we're, we're discovering that people's decisions to engage in particular disciplines were actually an output of the context they were embedded in and the affirmations about their ability to do well in those disciplines. That it was less of a reflection of their intellectual ability but more of how the context allowed that to happen. Now, why is that fascinating and why do I want to bring that to UVU? Like, why, like, like I'm tingling and I can't get this stuff out? Because, because we actually have an opportunity as a teaching institution to do pedagogy that focuses on the merging of the techies and fuzzies across disciplines. 
like as a, as an institution that focus like hyper focuses on 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 teaching as the anchor of the instruction, we have to also understand that that young man who who created the cocoon to bust himself out of it, we could use that project to teach math and make him more mathematically literate. Are you following? Like in an institution where all the faculty can fit into this room, the opportunity for us to engage in interdisciplinary conversations about how we improve the nature of our teaching, it's ripe. Like I could go somewhere else and give a talk, they can't get it because they're too caught up in their foolishness, they don't understand the value of teaching and I can't fit them all in this one place. But here, but here, we can do it. I mean, you, you know, we're sitting in tables right now with folks who are in different disciplines who can understand that we can, we can do this thing better. We could do this thing different. And then most importantly, we could also deconstruct those of us who are not naturally good at this, who worked hard to do it, to, to understand that just because you worked hard to do it and you hated every piece of the process doesn't mean that the next generation has to do that as well. Major key, right? Because see, when we get affirmed for our brilliance, we start thinking that everybody else has to go through the same process as we did. And you're special. And you're, you, 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 you did it, great. But maybe not everybody else has the same kind of context you had. And how can we ensure that our teaching does not reflect a focus and an anchor on make it just as bad as I had it because you need to be able to go through it. Do you guys know, oh gosh, um, do, 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 do you guys know that, um, do you guys know that the sequence of teaching science across this country was decided by some folks at the university where I work at that was probably just like a drunken decision um, where you teach earth science first, bio next, chemistry next, and physics next, and the whole entire world follows that same sequence of science teaching that some couple of dudes decided. And we know as folks who actually do scientific research that the nature of that sequence is problematic because it runs counter of what we know is right to do. But we keep on doing it because we keep on doing it. How can we at UVU be an institution, I've, I've hired myself here at your school, I'm sorry, like, but how can we at UVU start redefining practices based on what we know is right to do and start shaping the conversation for the rest of the country? Look, institutions who have been given the title of having the best institutions in the world maintain their position simply by being known as those institutions. One of my very good friends who's a physics professor at Harvard has literally said, you know what, I'm not gonna give assessments for a test at the end of the year anymore. I'm just gonna give assessments throughout and have kids have conversations with each other. And everybody says, oh my gosh, that's brilliant and groundbreaking. You know that's what's right to do here just because of what you know is right to do. But we keep following these invisible heroes because they're just invisible heroes. Why can't we be our own heroes? Why can't we redefine what that practice looks like for us? Look, now that work requires revolution. I know that's a scary word. This is my, where I scare people and they walk out. You know, and then you want us to have a revolution? You know, the president's like, oh my gosh, who's, why did we bring this guy here? You know, what do I mean by revolution? I'm gonna define revolution. Revolution is defined as a fundamental change in political power or organizational structures that takes place in a short period of time when the population rises up in revolt against the current authorities. Again, that might make the authorities and the administration feel uncomfortable. But how about that is the case in a R1 institution? In an institution that's predicated on teaching better, do you know who the current authorities are? The teachers, the professors, the instructors. So if a revolution is a revolt against the authorities, this is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to engage in a revolution against yourselves. I, what I am advocating for is an internal revolution against our age-old practices. Now, revolutions can mean two things. A revolution mathematically is that I start here, and I end here. Uh, technically, that's a revolution. No, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm, I'm talking about a, a distinct revolution in your everyday practices now. What does a revolution in everyday practices look like? It looks like you just committing to not do things the same way you did it before. And then, I, like my students do okay in my class. I'm telling you that a revolution entails just being unwilling to do things the same way you did it before. Maybe it's about time that you just stop doing the same thing you've been doing for 20 years straight and try something different. Now, what does a something different look like? I don't know. You figure that out. 
But by virtue of doing something that's outside of the existent norm, you shock the students into witnessing and experiencing and wanting and desiring something different. Look, if I have four classes a semester and every class starts the same way, guys, please open up your syllabus, or you guys have a really great system now so you could go online and look at it. I've been doing my research, I promise. You know, go online and look at your syllabus and then let's talk about, and if every single, and then let's do an icebreaker so we all get to know who's in this class and they go through that same exact rote process. Every single class for the next three classes, they, you've already implanted in them that this is gonna be like everything else they experienced. If they walk into your class on the first day and you pick out the part of the lesson that excites you the most and you teach with that, even though it's out of sequence, and they feel like you're on fire for your subject, you've got them for three, four, five more classes, and then five classes later, you invent and try something else new. Look, guys, this is a place that wants to revolutionize the practice of the teaching. So you've got to revolutionize yourself in the act of your teaching. Next slide. <laughs> Who here is a Stevie Wonder fan? Anyone? Raise your hands. All right. See, now I know I'm at home. I might not go back to New York after this. So Stevie Wonder is my favorite singer um, of all time. And, and just a sidebar, I also feel sometimes that nobody around Stevie really loves him and it makes me sad. Um, and the reason why is because there's no reason why his dreads start here. And if someone really cared, they would have just gave him my haircut. And it, it bothers me that no one cares about Stevie. That was not the point of my speech at all. I just, I just had to share that. Um, we will all write a letter to Stevie's management and address that issue. Um, so Stevie Wonder is my favorite singer. Um, and his most famous album is Songs in the Key of Life. Anyone knows that album? Wait, if you don't clap for Songs in the Key of Life, I will walk off this stage, all right? Um, so don't clap for me, clap for that. And that album has probably the most re-recorded songs of all time, Ribbon in the Sky, uh, Love's in Need of Love's Today. It's, it's, just, it's the most brilliant album. And when it came out, that album was so critically acclaimed. Everybody loved it. And, but before he created the album Songs in the Key of Life, which I argue is a metaphor for teaching because true teaching should be in the key of life, meaning that it should reflect what the students are experiencing every single day. Like I don't care if you're teaching art or science or biology or underwater basket weaving, the role of an active teacher is to make it connect to the key of the life experiences of the young people. And I think you guys get that. But before he could create Songs in the Key of Life, about three or four years prior, he created an album called Inner Visions. Does anybody know Inner Visions? A, a few real fans, right? Now, everybody knows Songs in the Key of Life. Not everybody knows Inner Visions. That's important. See, Songs in the Key of Life is where we want to get UVU to get to. We want UVU instructors to get to the point where they are creating hits upon hits of classroom lessons every single week that set the students on fire and they love every single one. That's the goal, right? But the thing is, you cannot get to Songs in the Key of Life. You cannot teach in the Key of Life until you first create the Inner Visions first. The Inner Visions album was not popular. It didn't sound as great in the eyes of many people. It was a personal album that Stevie Wonder had to do. It talked about the same themes as Songs in the Key of Life. Y'all following me right now? The same themes as Songs in the Key of Life, but it was more for him. Does that make sense? So you cannot teach in the Key of Life until you first do Inner Visions work. Inner Visions work is what we're gonna do together today. I have a little workshop later on, we're gonna talk about it. That is when you do the inner work of deconstructing what made you who you are today as an instructor. How often do you ask yourself, who was the instructor that made you be uh, in love with the discipline that you're teaching today? Do you ever ask yourself that? Now, if you ask yourself that, do you ask yourself how close or how far away I am from that person? Like, like the individual's work is the dirty work. You know, the title of my talk today was like, the root of teaching these populations. The, look, you, you, anybody ever plant? You ever plant something in the ground and, and like, I have like a little patch of land because I live in New York, like I can't afford much land, but I, I, I try to plant, right? And I'll put on these sanitized gloves and every time I dig in, if I have a hole the size of a pinhead in my gloves, 
inevitably the dirt gets into my gloves and I get dirt under my fingernails. And it always happens. See, the work of truly teaching cannot just be the glossy part I opened up with, because I want you guys to get on my side first. Now I'm going to challenge you. It's requiring and understanding the dirt that you got to dig into first before you can do that work, the inner visions work. Now, are you okay with me talking about some inner visions work? Because I'm going to challenge a little bit. Are you sure? All right. All right. You got to do excavations. You've got to confront the fact that there are reasons why we don't focus on the needs of populations who are first generation because we collectively have a certain bias against those populations. We've got to confront the fact that when a student comes into our classrooms and speaks with a certain accent that's not the accent that we're most comfortable with, we hold some bias against that student. And you say, no, we don't. We're Christian, we're Mormon, we don't hold biases, we love everyone. And I'm telling you, by virtue of being who you are and going through academia and going through the process of education, you do. And not only do you hold them, they're impacting the way that you connect to those students. And guys, if you can't address and confront those issues first, you will not be the type of institution that you want to be. It requires excavations. Do you know that archaeologists can know that there's something in the ground that they want to find in that ground? And you guys all want to find the potential of the students in the ground, but they will choose not to do the excavation in that place because they feel like it may trouble the people who are in the surrounding areas? That's a metaphor for what we do as educators. Our, an unwillingness to dig deep into the dirt of our own biases and preconceptions and misconceptions about those students that inhibits us from doing the excavations to get them to be successful. The excavations are personal, they're institutional, they're historical, and they're also contemporary. And <laughs> I'm going to skip this right now. And actually, I won't. And the inability for us to collectively acknowledge our biases against the students, whether personal or institutional or historical, turns us into bodies with eyes that move that can't move into action. And if you look at this image, the heads, it's like, almost like my version of an art history conversation, right? The heads of these images are big. And the, the, the big head represents a head that's full of knowledge. So the head is full of knowledge about what is right to do. The eyes are big because they can witness what is right to do. The body is paralyzed because there's not an acceptance of the fact that there are things in my history and my experience that is inhibiting me from doing the work that's right to do. We become bobbleheads of teachers as teachers when we fail to recognize the biases that we hold when it comes to changing the lives of these young people. It also requires us to understand that despite whatever we want to do to transform the lives of young people, they are living in this world. And our unwillingness to confront the fact that they live in a world of Trump speeches that, that are anti-first gen in many ways, of Hillary pontifications that we might not be clear about, of protests, of, of, of folks feeling like their lives don't matter, of folks being attacked by the criminal justice system, and we may feel as though but Emden, that has nothing at all to do with us being effective teachers for our first generation students. We just want to be effective teachers and just do well. And I'm saying to you, if you don't dig deep in the dirt, you are paralyzed. You are not reaching your full potential as an educator. The students who are walking into your classroom at 19 or 20 or 24 or 25 or 27 are living in a world where these phenomena are impacting their psyche on a daily basis. If they are the targets of words and statements being made by folks in a political party, it is affecting their self-consciousness. I did some work in New York City around PTSDs where we, we talked to young people who were experiencing evidence of trauma. We have a, a, a strong veteran population here, and a good friend of mine, Dr. Napoleon Wells, works with people who have gone to, the war, to war and have experienced trauma. And he says to me, you know, you know th there are certain things that, that you cannot understand about someone who's gone to war and experienced the type of trauma these folks understand. And, and I said, I, 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 okay, explain to me more. And, and the reason why I went out to talk to him is because I said, man, I'm having some issues with these students I'm trying to work with. We got a bunch of first generation students. They're Latino and Latina. They're going into the schools. They're underperforming. They, they are, they're, they're enacting these certain behaviors that run counter to the school. We want them to do well. And I can't understand why they're not doing well. Maybe you can give me a psychological analysis. And, I, and I'm, I'm describing the behaviors of these students. And he says, Chris, they're experiencing PTSD. And I was like, how? You, you talk about war veterans. How can that be experienced by people? And he said, well, there's a, there, there, there are versions of PTSD that are untroubled. 
Do you know there's a poor treatment and society disorder that invokes trauma in people? That the accumulation of microaggressions in the world affects my ability to see myself as being able to learn and cause me to leave and drop out of school? Do you know there's a poor teaching science disorder as a scientist? Where are my science people at? Raise your hands, don't be shy. Like, you know that all the teachers suck and we suck more? And there's a phenomena around science teaching in particular that makes folks say science or math. You ever see somebody, you say, oh, you know, are you good in science or math? And they literally have a physical reaction to you saying that. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm just, I, no math, no, I can't do science. Like, you're like, dude, why are you reacting that way? Like, you ever have somebody, you go to a restaurant with them and you want to split the bill at the end and they're like, they, they push the, 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 tick, the check away from you because they don't want to calculate? That's not, a, that's not normal. And I'm telling us as educators that it's, as science educators, it's because we didn't, we made them feel like they couldn't do it and it wasn't for them. We contributed to that process. And so part of the job of the teacher, y'all with me this morning? Part of the job of the teacher is to understand that you are also a healer. You have to be a healer. You have to be able to create spaces in the classrooms where you engage in dialogues about young people, about what is inhibiting them from being successful. You must create the space for it. You can't tell me there's not enough time on a semester and we have an exam at the end and we have subjects to cover. Like all of that stuff is inconsequential if you are going to teach all the content in the world and they're going to forget it after your exam. It, it, so if UVU is truly going to be a leading, cutting edge teaching institution, then we have to, as a collective, force as a faculty say that we are going to carve out the space in our classrooms where we will have conversations and dialogues with our students to talk about what their barriers are to learning and their barriers that they overcame to get into this place. That they feel as though walking into a class is a healing process because when you walk into a class and you can let go of those things, you know, can I have a volunteer? Can you come up? Yeah, why not? Yeah, come on up. Yep. Thank you so much. I'm trying to pick on you. Look. Because I, I, I feel like I want to make this point, and I, I don't know if you'll get it unless I try to make the point. So hold the book, which is my book, and it's really good. So hold the hold, so, book. Now, now he's holding on to this book. This book is an accumulation of all his experiences in life to this point. He's a first-generation student, worked hard to get here. No one else in his family has been here before. He's been told when he was in high school that he couldn't do well in math or in school. He was an athlete, so they said, you're an athlete. You're not an intelligent person at all because people tell him that. You guys know that? And, and he carries all those emotions to the classroom. You guys with me? Now, I am an instructor, and I am teaching history. And I am going to teach you history. Do you understand that? Because I am in a teaching institution. I care about you. I heard the mantra. I heard the mission. It's been 75 years. We're going to change the world. And you're going to get this history. You're going to get this history, right? And so I walk to the class enthusiastic, and I say, here's the history. And, and I give it to him, and I place it right here. And what happens is the history falls. He's because he's holding on to something. I, I could give him the I could give him the history, and it stays enough for me to give a test or two. And the minute he walks back to his seat, he shakes, and the history falls. Are you guys understanding me? That and, and what we do is when we we're teaching institutions, so we're going to be more creative. We we say, okay, well you couldn't grab the history when I gave it to you. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be creative. I'm going to toss it behind my back at you, like. You know, I'm going to toss it behind, like between my legs. See, we're, we're doing all these things around what we think is right to do to deliver information effectively around pedagogy. I mean, I read that amazing booklet about the things that you guys have in place to, to go online and to have the students have tutoring. These are all amazingly wonderful things. But look what I'm telling you. All those things will amount to more fancy ways to deliver the content if you don't first begin with saying, how do you feel today? I understand the experiences of being first first person in your family be in college. I know someone who felt that way. And our first week of school talks about the, the challenges of a first generation student. And those who are not first generation, let them hear the story either, because they need to learn some damn empathy, excuse me, right? And, and so we talk about that. And, and we talk about your obstacles and your life and your family. And, we, and, and as I do all that kind of stuff, I can, I can take this away from him for enough time for him to feel as though, oh my God, keep your hands just like that. Oh my gosh, I am not holding on to all those things that society placed on me to inhibit me from learning. And now if I want to give him this content, he's going to take that content and hold it and carry it and can. 
But unless you first begin the teaching and learning process with the recognition of what they hold and creating spaces and classrooms where they can let go of that and be open to learn, it is all an exercise in futility. It is. Thank you. you know, are you willing to create that space? And I know, I, I, like, I know what you're thinking. I can see it in your eyes. Well, Emden, I'm not a personable person per se. I, you know, that's just not my... <laughs> it's just not in my personality to just, to just do those things. You know, you just got to do it. You know, people oftentimes say to me, Yo, you know, because when I work with urban youth in New York City, they say, the reason why you're so good with working with urban youth and getting them all to be engaged is because you're urban. And I say, you don't understand how badly I sucked when I first started to work with urban youth. Because I went in there thinking I was a superhero. I really did. I was like, oh, I'm an anthrobiochemist to teach science to urban kids who look like me. I shall save them and make their lives better. You know, like I literally, if I could have, I would have walked into class with a cape, you know, like to save them. And, and I was horrific because I didn't recognize that your students don't need saving. They just need recognition. They, they, that's all they want a recognition of their brilliance, a recognition of who they are, an affirmation of their inherent ability to be able to be successful, and then deliver the heck out of that information when you got it, right? So, so you know, gosh, I can't believe time is going by so quickly. This, this, this is nuts. I have so much to cover still. Um, are you guys still okay and you still with me? So do, let's do a, a vote. Like, what things do you want me to cover? Um, do you want me to, no, I'll just cover my stuff and we'll do a workshop in the afternoon. Is that okay? All right. Um, so. I want us to understand the mechanism of how this works. And I am not, any sociologists in here? Not that many? Okay, so good, so we could talk about them. All right, so listen. So after my success as a, 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 you know, in undergrad and, and in my master's program in the sciences, uh, I, I developed this, this is such a, like a natural, like, there's a science hubris. Science folks, you know what, you know what it is. Like, we just think like we're just super smart and everybody else is just not as smart. And, and no one tells us that. It's just by virtue of being successful in those disciplines. Because, you know, you hear the whole science for the best and brightest, you, that whole mantra. So I, I was like, so, social sciences, sociology, like, so what do you do exactly? Like, you study people. Um, when I go to the park, I study people. Like, why would I need a PhD in this? Like, this is, these are my perceptions for a very long time. I know, I'm just too honest, I know. And, and then, when I started studying the art of teaching, I realized that there's no field more powerful than sociology. Because it's not, you're not teaching content, you're teaching people. And when you understand that you're teaching people, then you learn ways to deliver the content more effectively. So I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of my version of Sociology 101 related to teaching and learning. Are you ready? I need applause, otherwise I'll just move on, all right? Not for me, for the readiness, all right. Now, Fundamental principle, I wish I had a pointer, but oh, this is huge, I don't need a pointer. The fundamental principle we all have to understand is that all human beings, can you hear me even though I'm away from the mic? No, I'll stay by the mic, I'm sorry. Oh, it's a recognition of the fact that, oh, I knew, I knew how I had this earlier. It's a recognition, I could have moved all around this room. The recognition of the fact that all human beings come into your institution and come into your classroom with social capital. What is social capital? It's essentially that every human being is coming to a place with knowledge, about who they are and where they're from that is an asset. This is important for us to note because it's gonna take a shift in our thinking to recognize that. Meaning, the child who came from a school and may have barely made it and then came into this institution because it was open enrollment, by virtue of knowing what it feels like to drop out of school, actually has some knowledge about dropping out that has value. So it's this notion that no matter who you are, you got value and strength and, and wisdom. It, I don't wanna gloss over this because this is huge. Do you guys understand or believe that at least? Kind of, sort of? Now, here's what's weird. All of us who are in this room also have our own forms of social capital. And our forms of social capital surround our brilliance and fancy degrees, right? So it's like, let's say I had two students who were dropouts. They would have the same experience on knowing how it felt to drop out. If I have two people who have PhDs, like I don't have to know you. I just can just connect with you because you know the grueling process of writing a PhD. Or Kat and I, for example. Like, I don't have to know Kat. I feel like Kat understands my pain. You know why? Because Kat has glasses on and I have glasses on. 
And no one else who doesn't wear glasses knows how it feels to be out in a cold day in winter and then walk into a building with heat and then our glasses just get like this fog and then we have to do this for a while. And by virtue of wearing glasses, she and I have a shared social capital. Let's say I walk into a room and it was just me and Kat. Can I, I'm gonna come down. It's just me and Kat and I didn't know anybody else. I, I'm like, oh man, who can I be friends with? It's a cold day, it's warm, I just did this in my glasses. Who else can I talk to? I would talk to Kat first, you know why? Because I would feel as though she knew what I felt. That makes sense? So our shared forms of social capital make us to communicate with each other, which is a good thing, except people who have shared forms of social capital actually form dense networks to each other. Meaning, we connect to each other based on all the things we have in common. So, you wear glasses, I wear glasses. Check. I'm black, you're white. No check, right? But you, laugh, you have polo shirts, and I, have a, I, I like polo shirts. Check, right? You, you, you stand with your arms crossed. I'm a hip hop person. We do this all the time. Check, right? So now, so now I'm, I'm identifying all these things that I have in common with you. And, th and we both love Stevie Wonder. High fives, dude. So now, by virtue of all these connected, you guys with me so far? By virtue of all these things, I'm gonna gravitate more towards this guy, like this guy's my friend. Now, what happens when I form dense networks with people who are like me, is that I now start disconnecting myself from folks who are, who are not like me. So now I'm like, shoot, I got a friend, we could listen to music together, we have b-boy poses together, why care about making friends with everybody else? So we form dense networks to each other. When we form dense networks to each other, we ostracize everybody else. When we ostracize everybody else, we cannot benefit from the values that they all have. Now, guys, I hate to break it to you. We all in this room are the privileged few who have sh shared forms of social capital. So professors talk like professors. Professors teach like other professors. Professors live in more affluent places like other folks who have a little bit more money. By virtue of our collective experiences, we are locked into a social sphere that's different from everybody else. And the people that we are different from is guess who? Your students, especially those first generation students because they have no idea about the things and forms and norms of engaging that you have. Do you understand that? So now, as a teacher, you've got to for a second stop and say, darn it, I need to bring those people who I've turned my back on along with me. So what's that gonna require? It's gonna require you identifying structural holes. Structural holes essentially are, if we have all these things in common, we're gonna look around, and remember Kat had glasses too? We're like, Kat doesn't like Stevie, does not do b-boy poses, does, is not cool like us, but you know she kinda wears glasses, right? So Kat, now, as an instructor, like we're both, we have to say, what is the thing that we have in common with our students? That's gonna be the dense network. You follow me? So your role is not necessarily to deliver the instruction, it's to first begin with saying, knowing and acknowledging the dense networks you're a part of and trying to identify the commonalities that you may share with a student. Now, the commonalities may not be around things that you think are valuable. It might be something seemingly insignificant. It might be around a song that they like. It might be around a fishing experience that they may have had. But the thing is, you cannot find the connector with the students unless you reveal the complexities of who you are. I was, I was getting to the point, I got to it. You, you see how I did that? The, so look, so, so when you go in based on a dense network, you bring to the classroom a version of yourself that you think you're supposed to be as instructor. But to be effective, you have to bring all full versions of yourself, which means now you have to be able to divulge personal information about who you are to your class, and it actually is a necessary pedagogical strategy. Y'all, oh. <laughs> like that, that, it, that it becomes a pro, like it becomes a deliberate part of teaching and learning is to you to be a human being to your students. Like your students, and I, I know this is gonna sound weird, but I'm gonna put, they need to know about your wife and your kids and where you went on vacation and all you did this summer, and you have to find as an instructor, and I don't care what you're teaching, a way to incorporate those aspects of your authentic self to them. Because when you bring all of those selves into the classroom, then the students find a thing to identify with to connect to the discipline. See, the, the extraction of our authentic selves from our pedagogical selves inhibits our effectiveness to connect to students. Students don't connect to you because you're just so good at art or history or science. Frankly, they don't care. 
they connect to you initially because, man, that guy has a cool beard. Like, seriously, like those things matter. And, and the, 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 the presence of those things are the anchor of instruction. You following? So, so okay, so I'm going back. So now, um, I want to just, I'm closing out, although I don't want to. I got three minutes. Darn it, three minutes. Okay. Um, are you learning stuff? Okay. So the, the job here, and I'm giving you language for this stuff. I'm, do, I'm doing a workshop later on that's going to give you more specific strategies. I just want to give you guys a, the, bar, the backdrop. The idea here is, and you guys have all seen this image before, right? Of the, of the you know, the deep belly of this, this iceberg. Your core identities are actually more complex than the role identities that you put forth in the classroom. And I'm asking you to tap into your core. And this notion of role is so important because your ro every human being has identities, right? So your identity is who you are when you walk into a particular place. Um, some of you right now, like I'm looking at this table, right? Just, I want everybody to just look at this table. S sorry guys, I'm gonna put you on the, on the spot, right? So Kat, you're gonna be out of the table for example for a minute, right? But if you look at the table, these are all very well-dressed gentlemen with buttoned up to the T, great ties, and even collectively hand clasps. Do you realize that? Like, it was a thing. I, like, genuinely, they're, they're all, like, hand-clasped, right? It is, I'm not picking on you guys, but I am picking on you, right? So, and I know these are, like, the, you know, the, the, the big shots here, right? But, so they're all sitting here with this, the same sort of behavior. Now, I'm going to tell you that somebody in their lives, if they walked in here right now and saw them like this, would be like, you fraud. <laughs> right? Now... For you guys, you're like, oh, that's, they sit, and they're, that's what they do. But, and they're like, dude, you really? Do you know what that is? Is that as a human being, we identify that in different spaces, we have different identities. So they're enacting a role identity. Our role as administrator and professor in the space requires us to have a certain decorum, certain attire, certain dress, certain whatever, right? But you don't know what these guys are like when they're home. Sorry, guys. Like, when they're home, they could be completely different people. Right, they could like get home. He's like, heck yeah, I am, right? I mean, he might go home and he might be in a car once he gets out of here playing Biggie and Tupac. You just don't know, right? And you wouldn't know that because the self in here is he's experiencing, he's, ex he's sharing his role identity. Now what I'm saying is that he would be so much cooler if all his students knew that he liked Biggie and Tupac. You guys get my point? Now I'm gonna close out soon. What's my point? And, and I, I, I hope I've made a ton of points. My point is this, look, the work to transform the process of teaching and learning really requires us digging back deep to what is right to do about delivering information. It is about acknowledging that following rules or decorum or expectations actually inhibit us from connecting to the students who are most vulnerable and most marginalized. And I'll end with one quote. It's by Anais Nin, it's one of my favorite quotes. And, and it says, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And on Monday, the day will come where the risk to keep doing the same thing the same way over and over again is so painful that you want to do something to transform the lives of young people and allow them to blossom. And if we take that mantra to our work and our practice, we will make UVU the type of institution that we want it to be. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. What, what a performance. Uh, I, I do want to reassure the faculty, though, that next year we'll try to get someone a little more animated. Uh, so we, we, we tried hard this time. We'll do better next time. Uh, now, that was uh, in, a, in a level all its own, and it was moving us right in our sweet spot. Do you all know 
um, how many first generation students we have at Utah Valley University, what the percentages are. We're here in a very a relatively affluent uh, community, one of the uh, most robust economies in the nation right now, actually, uh, with a surrounding culture that often talks about education, preaches education. Any guesses? 36% of our students at Utah Valley University are first generation students. So this isn't just some minor thing that we're talking about. This is more than a third of the students who will be in your classrooms come Monday morning uh, are, are the population that we're talking about today that we've got to reach if we're going to live up to this dream. And I can't imagine a better set of remarks, more inspirational, more practical for what we want to do to achieve our greatness as a teaching institution in this community. So thank you again. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff Olson for his remarks and for his uh, uh, continued leadership of academic affairs and Mark Bracken doing a great job in faculty senate. We'd miss him, but Chris, if you want to take him on the road as your history catcher, I thought you two really had a chemistry up there. Okay, all right. Uh, and uh, Courtney, is Courtney still here? Where's Courtney? Uh, that was phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, uh, as a big champion of uh, liberal arts education, I. I absolutely loved what you had to say, and, and as applied and practical as, as we, uh, we uh, tend to be and technological with all that we've got going on, it's just a really important message as a serious university, so thank you, uh, Courtney, for that. Well, look, this is just a very exciting time to be at Utah Valley University, and uh, there's a lot of excitement on in the world, uh, just in general. Uh, we've got this, uh, you know, really inspiring presidential election going on. I'm glad, I'm glad you laughed. I thought Kat tipped her hand with her Trump comments earlier, but uh, no, uh, just kidding. Uh, so, uh, and it's the Olympics. And uh, I don't know about you folks, but I, I think the Olympics have been made far more exciting as the Olympics now uh, collide with social media. And so uh, what I'd like to do is just share a few of my uh, favorite observations from Twitter uh, uh, with you, and maybe you've seen uh, some of these yourself. First one comes from at technically Ron. The Olympics is brilliant. You watch physically glorious humans while sat on your sofa covered in crisp, screaming, go on, get better. Uh. Then there's Eric Shadow. A 41-year-old gymnast is competing in her seventh Olympics. I just texted my son, offered him five bucks to come down and hand me the remote. <laughs> Watch the graphic on this one. Phelps won by so much that even the graphic of his name is beating his opponents. <laughs> now this one you have to look extra hard and make sure that you look in the background as well as the foreground. When you realize they're the best swimmers in the world, so you're probably not saving any lives tonight. Uh, and then, of course, what truly has been my favorite uh, glimpse of the Olympics so far, when your parents finally meet your girlfriend. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, a very exciting time. We are in the midst of our 75th anniversary. A remarkable accomplishment for this institution that started out with uh, very humble beginnings. Um, I, in another venue earlier in the year at the State of the University, uh, gave a more detailed discussion of our history and where we came from. I don't really want to duplicate that today. Uh, and I, it's not usually my uh, habit to do this, but I, I will call your attention uh, to uh, the link that has that speech because it is, I think, really filled with such great and important history about where we've come from and, and, and who we owe to, to where we've come today. A lot of really heroic efforts, pioneering efforts that have produced uh, this institution that we enjoy today, and it's important that we honor our past that we see where we come from, that we see the people that have sacrificed and the courage that they've demonstrated and the innovations they brought to bear 
so that we can have the kind of institution we have today. I just want to, uh, again, for the more detailed version, go there. You got a little bit from Courtney today. I'll give you just a little bit more now to begin with. Uh, just a reminder, this was our beginning. This was our campus, 1941. We were really more or less a collection of post-secondary shop classes to help people escape the ravages of the Depression and to assist with the effort of World War II to support Geneva Steel, to develop welders and technicians that could support that war effort. This was our first faculty and our staff. We now have a faculty fall and staff convocation schedule. We have to meet separately. I met with the staff yesterday, similarly filled ballroom. I meet with the faculty today. If we did this, in, if we'd done this in 1941, it would have been these six guys at breakfast together, okay? That's the president and his secretary, and then five faculty. Uh, the woman on the right, her specialty, conversational English. For natively trained and, you know, uh, educated folks. That, that gives you a sense of kind of where, where we've come from. Here's our first class. Uh, not exactly a mecca of diversity there. Uh, that's, uh, that's who we were. Those were our beginnings. And uh, we became a small vocational school in 1941. Did that for a couple of decades. Then became a technical institute, then a technical college in 67. That was the, the instantiation of the institution that I knew when I was uh, growing up here in the valley. It then became a community college in 87. Very shortly after that, a state college. Uh, and finally, we're at our last seal, Utah Valley University. And that little humble set of buildings an old CCC barracks, dilapidated even in 41, built, frankly, by faculty and staff and students who kind of did it part-time, uh, is now this. Uh, this is our campus, uh, and this is not our only campus. We have a beautiful Wasatch campus. We have great facilities down by the Provo Airport for emergency services and aviation. And uh, we have this spectacular Capitol Reef Field Station in the heart of one of the most uh, uh, glittering national parks that we have uh, in this nation. Uh, what, what a transformation. Uh, as one of the uh, titles of, the, of our first, uh, well, it's really the title of our first history book, this is a miracle in this valley, what has happened. And we're celebrating 75 years of, of this uh, growth and the, this development. But as exciting as it is to see the transformation of those buildings, what really matters are the people here. And it starts uh, with you uh, faculty. And we are so grateful for uh, what, the, what the faculty do. Your, your accomplishments are truly remarkable. What you're doing in your disciplines, what you're doing in the classroom, and you're being increasingly recognized for that. Uh, for your scholarship, your papers, your presentations, but uh, even more importantly in the spirit of what uh, We've heard today your teaching, what you're doing pedagogically. And again, uh, not to undermine the, the revolution, which I welcome. Uh, we can do even better. But I do want to commend you for being committed and for taking uh, teaching seriously. Uh, and, and for your increasing visibility in the state, in the nation, around the world, for what you're doing in the classroom and in your disciplines. By the way, I, I know you're all real smart and connected but, and can connect things, but you get what's going on with the pictures and the circles and the Olympics and just, okay, all right, just, I didn't want anyone to miss it, okay. Uh, so, um, I want to say a word about our staff. We have a terrific staff at UVU, and uh, one of the things I appreciate about this, uh, about this institution I want to double down on is that I see less here what I see at too many other institutions, is a kind of a divide between the faculty and the staff. Uh, I hope that you faculty individually take the time to appreciate and recognize the staff that make your jobs possible. I talk all the time and openly that, that the faculty are, you know, they're, they're the central part of what we do here, but we can't do what we do without the staff, and so, uh, again, recognizing them and appreciating them uh, is an important part of what we do. But if I'm going to focus on anything today, I want to say something about our students. What a year we've had. Uh, I could go on and on about what our students have done, thanks to your leadership, your inspiration, your teaching, but also their hard work, their discipline, their courage. 
And uh, again, this is always hard for me to know. I, I just never have enough time to say everything I'd like to say. But just a, uh, just a handful of the prominent things that have happened with our students in just this year, in just 2016. So for the third year in a row, we brought home the Skills USA National Championship. Uh, yeah, thank you. People ask, do you still have the trades at UVU? The response, uh, just better than anybody in the nation. Uh, so three years running. Culinary Arts, uh, first national championship at the American Culinary Federation's National Convention in Phoenix. Uh, out of 7,000 applications for a TD Ameritrade scholarship, 12 students were selected nationally. Four of them were from UVU. And they got to ring the bell at NASDAQ. We've got recognized, le we, our leadership excellence program was a, a top three, actually two, uh, it was number two in the nation, so top uh, three collegiate leadership program in the world. Our marketing students won the Western Regional American Marketing Association competition and was top five at the national levels. Our UVU dancers were, were selected to perform at the American College Dance Association's National Conference, National CFA exam, has on average a 17% pass rate, the Wall Street Journal has called it the hardest exam in the world. What was UVU's pass rate this year? 80%. Remarkable. That happened because of great, committed, extra effort teaching. Five UVU students were named University Innovation Fellows by the National Center for Engineering Pathways to Innovation by the National Science Foundation. UVU students placed second at public health education conference and competition. And our digital media students won their first Emmy at the 37th Annual College Television Awards in Hollywood. So congratulations, guys. Now, just again, a brief word about some things that we're doing to advance student success beyond those greatest achievements of their students. Start with this exciting announcement, five new master's programs at Utah Valley University in cybersecurity, public service, computer science, county and social work. Uh, we had an array of programs. We focused on the ones that we felt were most ready, most needed, that we can most achieve uh, great distinction with and will best help launch our students into lives of, of success and accomplishment. And we're thrilled with that and all that's come with it. New graduate student office, graduate studies direct, director, new policies in place. It's a major step forward for us as an institution. And then finally, just a few other great things institutionally going on. We hosted our first dual language immersion fair for 1,200 dual immersion uh, fourth and sixth graders. Uh, a great success with a doTERRA fundraising effort. 75 scholarships for women in our 75th anniversary. Grateful to my wife Paige who took a leading role in working with doTERRA and helping to make that happen. Uh, along with that, scholarships to raise for uh, single parents, uh, student-led, student-initiated. Um, we un unveiled our 75th anniversary Eric Dowdell puzzle, cut the ribbon on a new dance complex, cut the ribbon on a new veteran success center. So again, just a taste of things. Could you join me in co complimenting and applauding our students and yourselves in a another remarkable year of accomplishment? Now, uh, what I'd like to, to do uh, next is talk about uh, what it is, what, what's so unique about what we've accomplished. And we, we've talked about that before. I want to revisit this issue. And I want to do so in the spirit of what, why I think we really should be celebrating today. Because it's not just that we're around for 75 years, although that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment in this day and age. That we're here, that we're vibrant, that we're growing. But why are we vibrant? Why are we growing? Why are we building all these buildings and able to add these new programs? Uh, it has something to do with the way we're responding. I think the thoughtful and unique way we're responding to various forces that are at, at work in higher education across the nation today. Now, uh, some of you may have been here a few years ago where I did something similar uh, about four years ago, five years ago at a state of the university where I talked about several forces. I've now, we've refined our thinking, I've refined my thinking, and, and I'm talking about six 
key forces that are at work in higher education that are really sort of complicated things that are going on and that present real challenges for higher education in so many places. And yet I think we're taking the right steps against them uh, or in response to them. So what are those six forces? Uh, let's uh, start with this uh, idea of the, the problem of rising tuition and fees. Very briefly, there are a couple of things going on here. There are some state pressures. Uh, historically, funds that went to support education are increasingly moving to entitlement programs. There's a legislative sense that higher education is a, a privilege more than, say, the right that we think it is for K through 12. And they, the legislators increasingly see tuition as a funding stream, again, nationally speaking. So, so state pressures lower state support all over the nation for higher education. At the same time, we've got national pressures, uh, and this comes from a variety of factors. Accreditation uh, and compliance issues, forcing more and more investments in staff and technology to be compliant, to meet accreditation, uh, adding to uh, uh, the need to invest in those uh, staff issues and in some of the uh, technological issues to be able to do that. The greater expectation that universities will do more to take care of students and to fix uh, issues in their lives and, and, and give them amenities. That's what institutions are doing more and more to uh, compete for students, meet them where they are. And then this idea of, of Harvard Envy. This is a little bit of an echo of, of, uh, of what Chris just talked to us about. Uh, there is too much this sense that the only bona fide university can be a tier one research uh, university like a Harvard. And that means uh, very low teaching loads, and very high research obligations, and those are very expensive institutions to run. And the combination of that has put an incredible pressure on the rise of tuition and fees across the nation. At the same time, we're getting more and more people questioning the degree relevance. Is a college degree relevant today? Now, I hope you're noticing the question mark. This is not Matt Holland's position. I do not question the relevance of a college degree today, but a lot of people are. You don't have to read very far to see headlines like the one up there. And this is a combination of the point we've just made, these six forces kind of work together, okay? So you've got the rising tuition and fees, and with that comes rising debt. And at the same time, industry is saying, we, 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 we need people with more immediate skills that they can use to go to work. And graduates are not working often in the industry of their major. And there's this badging culture of, we'll help you if you can show your competence or take some quick investment in a skill development, we'll give you a certificate or a badge and you go to work. So a lot of students, a lot of parents, a lot of citizens saying, is it even worth it to go to college? The irony is, in my mind, this is a third force, degrees have never been more relevant. They've never been more needed in the world. We are in a much more complicated place. There's a, a, much, rapid, there's a much more rapid rate of technological change. Markets are more sophisticated and more specialized. And we have this growing global connectedness. The world is shrinking. Students are interacting now, or employees and, uh, and employers are interacting now with people from cultures and places they wouldn't have had any reason to interact with uh, even a decade or two ago. And that's what the power of a college education will do. It will equip you to operate in an increasingly complex, sophisticated, technological global marketplace in addition to all the other wonderful things that uh, are important about uh, higher education and learning for the sake of learning. The growing access gap. I've just talked to you about 36% first generation at, even here at Utah Valley University. Again, with the increasing costs of higher education, we also see demographic patterns that mean we, we will expect to see more low income, more first generation, more ethnic minorities and immigrant communities who need access to education, we're going to increasingly find that they don't have access to it because it's too expensive for starters. And so that gap is, that gap is growing. It's a problem here in this valley. It's, a, I think, a, a becoming a sort of a crisis level problem nationally. It has implications for our democracy and for our civic health. Then we have this peculiar Utah phenomenon. Whereas uh, much of the rest of the nation has a kind of a shrinking high, higher education enrollment, Utah is in this middle of this population boom. And you can see the, the bar chart here that we've had this kind of steady uh, growth these, first, uh, these last few decades. 
where we've kind of gone from 250 to 500,000, a little bit above. But we're now in this period of growth for very soon there are going to be over a million people in this valley. And a lot of those millions of people are going to need higher education. In fact, our state system is anticipating that by 2025, we are going to have to add 52,000 new students to the system. Now, just again, to put that in context about what an anomaly is, that the majority of national institutions are decreasing in their enrollment. Utah is only one of two states, New Hampshire's the other one, that has had three consecutive years of growth in higher education. And, uh, and there's a reason why New Hampshire is in that category, which I'll explain in just a second. It's very different from just our natural demographics. So we've got to figure out how to deal with this growth issue. And then, uh, and then finally, there's the spreading disruption of technology. It is the world our students live in. Uh, we have to meet them where they are at some level. It's perceived as a cost saver. In some ways, that can be true when it comes to facilities and what we might do to maximize our physical infrastructure input. In other ways, it's not true. This requires heavy investments in technology and maintenance and software and technicians. So uh, there's a kind of a mixed bag there. It, it, it does appear that it could provide us greater flexibility in our delivery. That's important, especially important for some of our non-traditional students. And then there are these genuinely mixed reviews. Uh, that there's, there's, there's data we could look to that, that questions the quality of uh, education that's heavily online or, or uh, carried out uh, through a, a technological mechanism other than a human interaction. Other data, other research that we've looked at and that is right, ready and, and very credible says it can be used to enhance education and make improvements. So we're keeping our eye on that. I've got Southern New Hampshire up there. They have made a decision to go whole hog online. They still have on campus, they have about 4,000 students, but thousands and thousands of more now are entirely online. That's the reason New Hampshire is the other state that's growing with Utah with respect to higher education involvement. It's not because more people are moving in or they've got more people on their campuses. It's cause, just because they've got more students doing online learning through southern New Hampshire. So how, how is UVU going to respond to that? Well, what, is, what is our unique response? So um, it starts with our core themes. And uh, you may remember, just by the raise van, who, who was here in 2009 when I first started to kind of roll out some of these terms we call our, our core themes? So actually a pretty, pretty good number of you, but also a lot of new faces. Let me just give you a little bit of a recap on that history. As I was coming into this position, I, again, we were sort of asking ourselves, well, where are we headed? How are we going to define ourselves as an institution? did a lot of listening, a lot of visiting with people, and there were these four words that came to my mind for me that both described who we were already. Again, this was not new things we were going to become. It was what we were already, but what we also wanted to maintain and maybe even do better. And here are the four words. Serious. We were going to be a serious institution of higher learning. We were going to take academic, intellectual, sophisticated things very seriously and hold ourselves to high standards. And not just academic standards, professional standards, how we interact with each other, how we carry out our services. We would do those things in a first-rate way. That we would be engaged, that uh, we would be connected to the community around us, that we would be uh, cognizant of the real world, that we would try to have, make as many applications of our learning in the classroom and in the textbook and in our theories to what our students are encountering, that that engaged learning pedagogy would sweep across the curriculum that we would be inclusive, that this would remain a place for everyone, that we embraced our open admissions uh, enrollment policies, and that we wanted, we loved the fact that this could be a second chance destination for people who, who needed that opportunity and didn't have it. We didn't want to give that up. And that we wanted to make it a place comfortable for people from different races, perspective, walks of life, and viewpoints. And so that resonated deeply. And then finally, this word you all hated large. Uh, you didn't like that word. Everyone sort of liked the first three, but no one really liked the word large. Uh, and I was listening to that, and it made sense. Uh, that it didn't, you didn't want to be, that wasn't the aspiration. We didn't want to be large for the sake of being large. We liked the kind of the cohesive, small classroom feel of the place. So we kind of set that off to the side, and it led to a real breakthrough. I was grateful for the feedback, because it, it brought together, it brought forward a point that I was embarrassed that I missed. 
And that was this point, which is yes, serious, engaged, inclusive, but for what? And the answer was for student success. That's really why we're here. That's really what we're about. And so then we kind of shifted our model to say, okay, we embrace the fact that we want to be those three things, but at the core of our core is this idea of engaged, serious, inclusive in the service of student success. And that is really our defining element. We're here for those students. We're here to help them succeed academically, and we want that academic success to launch them into a life of further success. Intellectual success, social success, private industry success, civic contribution success. And that's our animating mission. So, I want to make sure that we do not lose sight of the core of the core. And we've done a lot on student success since then. We've got core, we've, under this core theme, we now have objectives and indicators that we're monitoring. These were all kind of collectively decided. Uh, our friends in academic affairs have, uh, have identified some essential learning outcomes that further delineate student success. We have some statements in our mission, our mission statement. But I think it's really important to sometimes just step back and say, do we all really understand what we mean by student success? And what are we really committed to institutionally? So I want to harken back to 2009 and do something I haven't done since then, which is take a little break here in the middle of my remarks and get your input. I want you to think about what student success means to you and what you think it should mean for the university. And so on your tables, there are these papers, and you've got some pens. I want to take 10 minutes, and just uh, uh, no more than 10 minutes, and uh, have you have a discussion uh, with each other about this question of student success. And there are three different questions, by the way. Uh, it's, I want you to think about it through the lens of how, what a student might, how the student might define student success, uh, what it would lead you to say that a uh, student is successful, and what you think the broader community is. If you'll, if you'll get a scribe for your table, write these down. We're going to collect these. And the idea is that we're going to pull this together in an in a, uh, aggregated statement. So have at it.
Here's your one minute warning, if you can uh, wrap up. Okay, I got the thumbs up from some of you. Let's, uh, let's bring it back if we can. Uh, thank you for doing that. If you will leave these uh, pieces of paper on your table, uh, we will collect them afterwards. And again, uh, we're, we're not trying to recreate the wheel here. We, we already have a lot of good thinking on this, but I think there is this sense that maybe coming out of this, there's an effort to coalesce what we're talking about in our essential learning outcomes and our mission statement, but also in what, uh, what may have been prompted from our discussion here for something like a student success manifesto, a kind of a single statement of our institutional commitment to student success and how we understand that, how we will promote that individually and collectively. So uh, this is the beginning of that process, is to hear from you, get your thoughts about that. So thank you for uh, taking time to do that today. So uh, with that, uh, let me come back then. So these six forces that are at work uh, across the nation and uh, with a little uh, unique twist here uh, in Utah given our own particular demographics. And so our unique response to this again begins with these core themes. With student success at the heart of it, supported by this mission of being serious, engaged, and inclusive. Now, that little word, large, uh, that no one really liked, I think we all recognize that we learned that maybe that's not our aspiration, but it is a function of our mission. That if we're going to be open in missions and inclusive, and we're going to help students stay here and succeed, we are going to be large and get larger. And that meant we had to be very serious about some administrative imperatives. And so we do have to operate effectively. We do have to manage growth. We do have to secure resources. And there's a whole set of practices that are essential for us to do this in order to uh, manage that mission forward. So there's so much we could talk about here in terms of how we're responding to each of the core themes of these administrative imperatives. Again, just a few highlights about some the things I think make us most distinctive in what we're doing. I could start with the example of structured enrollment. This is where inclusive, our spirit of open admissions, everyone welcome, anybody who wants a chance at education is welcome on this campus, encouraged to be here. In fact, we're going out and reaching out to populations that aren't inclined to be here to tell them that they are welcome here. That's what we mean about being inclusive, at least one of the things we mean about being inclusive. And yet, we have to be a serious institution. There need to be deadlines. There need to be expectations. There has to be a certain level of preparation for advancement into upper division work. So that's the power of structured enrollment. It doesn't solve all of the issues that we face, but it is a nice mix of those two ideals. And uh, we can look at a number of uh, implications of this, but uh, in terms of an update on the data, before we implemented structured enrollment, in 2011, at the first day of the semester, we had 33,000 students. By the last day of the semester, we had 32,500. We lost nearly 1,000 students through a revolving door who kind of came in, showed up, or maybe even didn't even show up the first day, but by the end, they were gone. That's a problem. That's wasted time and resource for them. It's a drain on your uh, efforts as faculty. That's, that needed to change. And one of the powers, I think, of structured enrollment is that that has changed. 
So you can see that whatever else has been going on with enrollment, you can see that dip and there's a lot going on there with the economy and the uh, LDS Church's missionary age change. Whether, uh, uh, whether enrollment's been high or low, since structured enrollment, we now have more students at the end of the semester than we do at the beginning of the semester. And this year, our highest, this last year, our highest number yet. So roll the tape back before structured enrollment. We lose a th nearly 1,000 students by the end of the semester. By, uh, by uh, th on this year, this, excuse me, this last year, we're up 300 students, meaning we're keeping most of the students who come through the front door on day one, and we're adding students on the block. Uh, we are keeping tuition and fees low. Uh, here's the UVU track record for the last few years, uh, basically since, uh, since I arrived. The two years where tuition got a little bit higher, 11-12, you recall that was the year of a budget cut. We just, that was the way we kind of kept the doors open and minimized the damage of that. Years 13 and 14, we had a major investment in a new student life and wellness building that has really helped transform student life on this campus. That just took investment that we needed to have and the students supported it. But sent other years, we've kept it as low as we could. In the last two years, for the first time in the history of this institution, we cut student fees with the support of our student officers. And that doesn't happen at very many places. And it's happening, by the way, in the context of a state that's already very low in tuition. So on average, Utah has the fourth lowest tuition levels in the nation. UVU is the 65th lowest net price institution in the nation. And that matters for access, and it matters for inclusion. And we're getting, again, national recognition for it. It also matters for student success because our students are leaving with less student debt than any other students in the nation. Thank you. So, one of the things that's important to underscore about that is when we talk about efficiencies on this campus, it isn't just because we sometimes struggle with the legislature and don't get everything that we want to get. It's that we have to work hard, relentlessly hard, to keep these costs controlled so they, they don't get passed on to our students. There are a lot of things that we do here. We have this planning budget and assessment process. I think it's one of the most transparent budgetary processes in higher education that I know of, for sure. Every decision, basically, that gets made with, with, with spending money has to be defended publicly and in light of our core themes and administrative imperatives. And if they can't be shown to support those things, they don't get funded. It's also by maintaining our teaching mission, by keeping uh, those teaching loads at the right level so that we don't become an extraordinarily expensive research operation. We watch our staffing ratios to make sure that our biggest commitments uh, are, uh, are in our faculty and those who are in the classroom teaching. Ongoing reexamination of core mission functions, and if they don't fit that, they go away and we introduce the things that do uh, uh, foster that having the highest levels of ethics and accountability and the management of our resources. Anyway, I can go on and on, but this, again, I, wanted, I just can't stress enough, this is not just because there isn't enough money in the system and we fight every year to get as much as we can from the legislature, but a big part of this is just to make sure that it stays accessible for students. Our inclusion plan, our strategic inclusion plan. So grateful for uh, Dr. Kyle Reyes and, and, and his committee. I mean, this really has gone beyond. I mean, it's kind of, as we all know, Kyle's had a great vision for this. But now there, there are dozens of you on the committee and around the, your colleges who have championed this, who are putting into action these 36 action steps, $2 million worth of investment to help make this a comfortable, supportive place for everybody. And we're getting national awards for it. This is just a glimpse of nationally recognized outlets that are looking at UVU and Orem, Utah for their innovation and kind of leading ways that they're taking on the, on the uh, inclusive front. Technology, we talked about that earlier. What is UVU doing about it? We have to embrace technology, but we're doing it different than the University of Southern New Hampshire. Uh, we've made some conscious decisions that, A, we're focused not on the world, we're focused on that service region map that Jeff talked about. This is a great way for us to get over to Eagle Mountain and to down in the south part of the county and Saratoga Springs and, and to meet students who can't physically get onto campus occasionally. 
we're, we're promoting hybrid courses so that we get the best of technology with the best of human interaction and the magic of the classroom that uh, we all felt today. Uh, and we're teaching for quality with uh, the academic affairs arranging their whole uh, emphasis on using technology not as much for efficiency or at least as much for quality as efficiency even as we learn to break bottleneck courses uh, through that. Five pillars of engaged learning. We've made some great progress. Grateful for uh, Dr. Fred White and his leadership in helping us refine further exactly what we mean by engaged learning and how we can fund it and support it, starting with internships, a sort of an obvious example of engaged learning, all the way through engaged learning in your curriculum. And then, of course, a, a great commitment to academic seriousness. Again, here are just a few things that I can, that are easy to point to, that are measurable. Doesn't say anything about the, the informal things that are so important that you faculty do relentlessly to create that academically serious environment. But you see the investments we've made in full-time faculty over the last few years. You see what's happened to our retention rates, what's happened to our completion rates. Now, 30% is not great, folks. And we have to own that. Now, there's some problems with the way we measure completion rates against our mission. The IPEDS data is a very faulty instrument for us, but it's the instrument of use in the nation. We have to be cognizant of that. But I, I would point out to the progress of just in a few years coming from 17 to 30 percent, nearly a doubling of our completion rate. We are definitely headed in the right direction, but we've all got to work together to make sure that we move that needle more, even more aggressively on getting our students finished. And then, of course, the uh, array of things. I, again, I could just give you a taste, a flavor of the awards that our students are winning, our faculty are winning, uh, that are making us uh, uh, nationally uh, recognized, uh, how, how much more competitive we're getting for graduate school, for top job placements. I see what's happening around just in, in my own presidential internship program, the, the quality of the student, their abilities, uh, is just remarkable and growing every single year. And then this all kind of culminates together in this very unique dual mission that we, we are doing it, folks. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was something of a hypothesis. Could this happen? It's working. We have built out a really terrific teaching university now. 75 bachelor's degrees, eight master's degrees, structured enrollment, students who are better and better prepared coming in the front door. At the same time, we are open admissions. We have a brilliant community college mission side by side with associate's degrees and certificates um, and lots of career and technical education. And these two things are working together. And folks, the students are voting with their feet. We've become the largest institution of higher learning in the state of Utah. We've, and we are going to continue to grow. We will never be caught. Uh, we will continue to be the largest, I believe, in perpetuity in this state. And again, we're not seeking to be large for the sake of being large or to boast, but I do think we can wear it proudly as a function of the fact that students are finding great success here. We have the programs they need. It's launching them into the careers and the lives they would like to have, and they're coming and they're staying. And that's, I think, a really important point. It's not just that we're getting bigger. We're getting better. You can see what's happened to the increase in our academic awards over the last few years. But this next graph for me is even more telling. Look at where we are relative to other institutions in the state system. In just the last five years, the change of numbers of academic awards. We've outstripped every other institution. And by the way, folks, this is not a function of our growth and demographics. If you roll the tape back five years, our enrollment's not that different than what it is today. Remember, we went through that dip because of the economy and the missionary age change. So really about the same number of students in the system as there were five years ago. We have gotten better. You have gotten better. Our staff has gotten better at pulling these students through, providing the programs they want, inspiring them to finish, bringing them across uh, to a kind of a victorious end of their academic experience here. That, my, folk, my friends, is a tremendous accomplishment, and it's, it's thanks to you. I, I just have to applaud what, what you're doing. Please join me. So, uh, a few years ago, I showed you uh, uh, something similar to this. I think it's worth revisiting. It's, it's a powerful, graphic, uh, data-driven illustration of just how unique 
this UVU mission is. So we start with this, uh, this uh, map of uh, all institutions in, in the nation that offer bachelor's, master's, and associate's degrees. There are about 3,000 institutions like that in the nation, and the colors represent the breakdown of degrees within an institution. And then you can start to play with this data. And you can start to see, well, okay, let's take it, let's just look at uh, uh, institutions that have a head count of more than 10,000. You go from 3,000 to 380. So that starts to tell you just how unique it is, just, just our size compared to so many institutions that try to do what we do. Then you look at public versus private, which has its own dynamic. You go down to 284 institutions. And then you look at those that are still open admissions. There are 30 institutions left, again, that start to meet that overall profile. And then you look at those that have, let's just look at those that have 10% bachelors and 10% associates. And you're down to about a dozen institutions. You see something going on in Florida. Uh, and you can't really see it on the map, but it's in Alaska. Florida's starting to follow the model that UVU has been on for 20 years now and having some success with that. Uh, then you look at, okay, let's go from 10% to 20%, and you're down to four institutions. And then finally, look at 25%, uh, and we're the last institution standing, over, over 30,000. And by the way, our ratios are something more like 40-60. There's not another institution anywhere in this nation doing what we're trying to do with this unique dual mission on the size and scale that we're doing it. And again, it's working. The students are coming and they're completing. So we have a lot to celebrate. And uh, in, the, in the spirit of, of Courtney's comments, one of the things I love is that the culminating moment of our 75th anniversary will not be about necessarily statistics or anything. It's going to be a work of art. It's going to be the unveiling of the Roots of Knowledge windows in our library by Tom Holdman. This is an extraordinary piece of art. I think it's a piece of art that's for the ages. 200 feet long, 80 panels, 80,000 pieces of different stained glass that represent the highest human achievements in art, architecture, music, literature, science, law, philosophy, theology. It's all there. Uh, maybe not, may, may, may not all of it's there, but you get the picture. Uh, it's as creative and beautiful and artistic uh, a work as I've seen in this state, frankly. And what I love about it is it's not just the function of the mind of Tom Holdman, it's the function of the mind of our faculty. Many of you that I can see in this audience today are part of the committee that's helped with this. We've had over 400 students involved in this project. So is it an engaged learning project? Absolutely. Is it inclusive? Yes, it represents all of those disciplines as reflected in the innovations that come from the Middle East, the ancient world, the modern world, North America, South America. Uh, so it's got that inclusive feel to it and it's absolutely serious. It is the representation of those finest things that we study, that we think about at a university. That will be unveiled on November 18th. I hope you'll mark that on your calendars and uh, look forward to that as, uh, again, our culminating moment of this year of 75th anniversary. Here's a few, a few glimpses of some of those pains uh, that, again, kind of start with uh, the, the beginning of time, if you will, on up through our contemporary day today. So with that, uh, I do want to say, uh, as I wrap up here, uh, something about the future. So we've had a fantastic 75 years, but uh, as I've said before, our best days, our best accomplishments are ahead of us. And so as we look, take a, this vista from uh, Mount Timpanogos, which sits in our seal, what do we have to look forward to into the future? Well, there's some very exciting things in the, in the immediate future. Uh, very shortly, we're going to have cut the ribbon on a new center for autism, one of the great issues facing our community today. We're going to cut the ribbon on a new basketball practice facility for a team that I think uh, I just am so excited about what this team is going to achieve uh, this year. And by the way, while I'm at it, I will mention that our soccer team was just ranked 28th in the nation. Uh, not bad for a team that's only been around for four years. Um, yeah, thank you. 
For Courtney and her colleagues, we're building a new performing arts center, and we will be breaking the ground for that on December 1st. Uh, another big project beyond that will be a new business school and a new campus front. Uh, but we've got needs beyond that, and so we bought this property out at Vineyard. I'll just give you a very quick update on the master planning process here. We came to you uh, in a series of exchanges uh, in faculty senate, in public meetings with uh, faculty and staff to get your input about what we do with the Vineyard property. And four models were developed. Is it a feeder campus? We kind of have the community college out there and, and do uh, uh, more university work here. Uh, do we have a dual location, just kind of develop things as they will and have students back and forth? It, or is it a specialty campus with kind of unique standalone programs out there? Or is it a service and support campus? Uh, by far, the, the data came through that the, the favored uh, plan was for a specialty campus. Those things that could go out there and be kind of standalone, where you don't have to have a lot of back and forth. It's still, even though it's connected with public transportation, still kind of a challenge and a disruption to get back and forth. So that's the direction we're going. It will, we'll, we'll, we're designing it for specialty campus space, but also supplementing it with services and support. We can move some of our services and support uh, activities out to Vineyard. Uh, then we can create more space on this main campus to keep the academic integrity of a university. And in the spirit, again, uh, of Chris's remarks, where we want, we want collaboration across disciplines. So we really don't want to put business out at Vineyard and have the arts be here. We want you guys working side by side and collaborating together. And that means making more use even out of the space that we've got. So. Uh, we'll move out academic specialty buildings. We'll have a community engagement park out there. A lot of athletics uh, and, and student life, not the day-to-day -day student life, but some student life support things like intramural sports could move out there. And then some facilities are warehousing and other things that again can free up some space here. That gives you just again a very initial rudimentary glimpse of kind of where things might go. You'll be getting a more detailed look at this a little bit later. But that does create some space that we need for other new facilities. We're very shortly going to grow out of uh, room for our School of Education. Uh, we need today expanded space for computing and technology. Uh, we're going to have significant growth going, no, when, we know, when we look at the data, we see what's happening in the health professions, what we're going to have to do to expand West Campus. So that means, even though we went into this master planning the Vineyard Campus, we've got to relook at our master plan here at the main campus. Uh, and we've got to do some structural things so that we can handle even more traffic and, and energy here. So we're talking about a new freeway interchange on the north end of campus. We're talking about a pedestrian bridge that will connect West Campus and the main campus. Wow, if I'd have known instant applause, we would have decided that years ago. Uh, so. Uh, and, uh, and a new uh, uh, interchange off of I-15 uh, heading, heading northbound directly into campus to break some of the traffic bottlenecks there. And of course, uh, building out uh, satellite campuses at Thanksgiving Point and Payson, which uh, we're uh, just solidifying the final uh, arrangements there for uh, 30 acres at Payson. So uh, w with all of that, uh, again, that's very brief. There's a lot of thinking that's gone on, a lot of interaction with faculty and staff and administration, working with planners and trustees. Our work is not finished, but I wanted to give you a glimpse of where we're headed, folks. We've just started to scratch the surface of what this university is and what it can become. And I think it will especially remain exciting and vibrant if we will stay true to this mission, this mission of a teaching university that draws the students in inspires them, electrifies them, and moves them forward better prepared to serve in their communities, earn a living, enjoy the richness of the life around them. That's what we're about. It's, it's, it's not as, as exciting as buildings are, as programs are, as statistics are. At the end of the day, it's about the students. And uh, I, I want to just close with a, just one brief glimpse of a student on this. This is maybe not the most inspirational story, but I, I, I wanted to use it because it's just so timely. It shows how every single day we're working hard as an institution on this issue of student success. It's the story of Joshua Fe Felix. Yes, uh, a week ago, yesterday, 
Joshua Felix got an email from his employer saying that they were in the midst of corporate downsizing and he was being let go with a month's salary. He's a young guy, he's married, he has children, and he was all of a sudden put in a sort of strait of desperation. Two days later, he got an email from Utah Valley University as part of our some uh, college no degree program. He's just a few classes shy of a degree. And as a result of our commitment to student success and a combination of faculty culture and staff diligence, we reached out to this guy and said, hey, come back and finish your degree here at UVU. He came in, he met with counselors, he's met with faculty, he's got an internship set up. With tears in his eyes in our Student Success Center, he said, for years I've been struggling professionally because every time I try to get a more stable form of employment, I'm turned down because they say, we like you, but you don't have a degree. This is going to change his life, and it's not even the most transformative story I could share with you today. You know those stories. These are your students. They're in and out of your lives. I don't have to detail them for you. I just want to remind us collectively that that's what we're about. We're about changing those students' lives and doing it on scale. And that's what's going to be exciting and motivating and inspirational for the next 75 years. I couldn't be more grateful and honored to be your colleague in this critical, important, noble work and look forward to the future which is as bright and exciting as any I've ever felt. Thank you very much.